Okay. Well, I, I think we'll uh, we'll begin today's Rising Tide Foundation lecture. Um, it's September the 11th. Obviously, there are a lot of major developments that have swept across the world this week. This is a, a solemn day in some ways. It's a day where a lot changed around the world um, 21 years ago. And the consequences of some very bad decisions that were put into motion at that time um, are still being felt. And the chances of humanity making through the current storm exist, but it requires that we have a better appreciation, not only for the recent history, but also the deeper causes of the longer waves of history, which has been sort of a topic that has been moving in and out of all of the presentations that we've been hosting over the course of the past three years, the Rise and Tide Foundation, with our weekly lectures and our, our study groups and writings and everything else. The, the cause of these subtle waves that I think a lot of people are unaccustomed to dealing with deal really with this question of mind and matter, the metaphysics and physics and how the how the metaphysics, the, the, the realm of ideas that transcends the, the, the world of change, of flux, of becoming, um, which is constantly ephemeral, it's constantly bounded, is there, there is a relationship. It's not like these are two separate universes that have no interconnection, but they have to blend and actually uh, be understood to dance together in a very natural way. And the greatest ideas going back to the ancient times of you know the writings of Plato, reading Cicero, reading Augustine, there, there, there's been the greatest of, of statecraft of great thinkers, great scientists, great artists have grappled with this. And especially the, the relationship of how it is that ideas of truth, ideas of beauty, ideas of justice, which you can't cut in half, you can't bound them with a beginning and an end the way you can, you know, the, the things like my cup or a bus or whatever, there's, there's more of a, a bounding in space and time. Ideas of justice, beauty, you can't, you can't treat them the same way, but how do they interface with each other? How, how does one shape the other? And of course, when we approach history um, from the standpoint, a full spectrum approach, a holistic approach, we recognize very quickly that history is shaped by individuals who have ideas and translate those ideas into action, into conspiracies for good and for bad. And that the ideas that they have, the way things should be, often defines the planning of what types of futures they want to bring to being. And so history, is, history as we know it is not really the study of the past, it's a study of futures that did or did not come into being to varying degrees. And that is really, I think, the substance and soul of the drama of the past. And I, I, that's why I love listening to Marty, because Marty has tuned himself over years of diligent work to looking for drama, looking for psychology, looking for what, what is under the surface appearance of things. And he does it with a sort of creative zest that I, I find just really gratifying. <laughs> so I think here, you know, Martin and I were, were chatting a couple of weeks ago about uh, different possible ideas of, of lectures, and he threw out amongst a, a whole myriad of ideas at, at, that he pitched. One of them really struck home uh, with, with Cynthia and myself, Pascal. We, we talked about it. We're like, yes, Isaac Newton, Newton, two different paradigms. Uh, take, you know, we, we want to see his treatment. And every time Marty speaks, there's something new that is awoken. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm sure, fascinated. I'm sure we all have fun with this. And like usual, we're going to have questions and answers at the end. So put your names in the, in the queue. Um, I'm not going to say anything more. I mean, you know, Marty, go for it. You, say, oh. your, say your piece. <laughs> I'm fond of saying, and I must have done it to this audience too, um, you, you know, I, I do go in for a lot of repetition, that it is always terribly embarrassing to be introduced by a very dear and close friend because they tend to boost you up so highly that whatever you say, however hard you go, you can't possibly match up to the wonderfully high expectations your friend has given for you and delivered for you. And of course, you've just done that again, Matt. But here, I want to back into Newton and Franklin. This is a concept, although I've been fascinated by both of them in different ways much of my life. Marty? Uh, oh, hang on, my, I thought my video, video was just, there we are. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Are we on? Yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, Isaac Newton dies in 1727. He overlaps with uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was born around, I always do not have a head for these dates, around 1706, if I recall. And so uh, Franklin was well aware of Newton. Newton would have had no cause to have any uh, awareness of Franklin whatsoever. 
but uh, 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 when when he he died, already one of the most famous and eminent men in the entire world. But the two of them turn out in their lives to be extraordinary complements and conflicts to each other. They are a study in contrasts, and beneath the surface we find extraordinarily parallels as well as striking contrasts between them. And your term, Matt, before about so much of life being creative, about being a dance, about being an interplay, applies here too. We will find parallels in talents, interests, uh, abilities between Newton and Franklin that one never thinks of. We will also find in the most fundamental and important areas, of course, they are not parallel or complementary at all. They are a study in contrasts, but more especially and fundamentally, we come back, we start as the great Renaissance humanists all did, and they took it from Plutarch, they took it from Cicero, they took it from the Greeks. Man is the measure of all things, and personality is destiny, character is destiny, which is the constant theme of Plutarch in more than 150 of his great biographies. And this is what we find here. With Newton and Franklin, we start with personality. And personality leads us to the philosophies, the very different philosophies they each embraced, and to the life paths they took, which were totally different life paths. Franklin starts in empire and never questions it at first. And he only becomes a Republican, a revolutionary, when he is already in his mid, well, not mid, but already in his 60s, in his the middle of his seventh decade of life when only a frac tiny fraction of human beings already lived that long and he already also had another 25 years to go newton by contrast starts as an outsider apparently a figure for freedom and independence he starts as a heretic so it appears he starts as a heretic and uh which ought to, a religious heretic it's a dark secret that he has to keep much of his life but he steadily progresses to becoming an insider at the very heart of the establishment and a very dark insider, as we shall see at the heart of the establishment. Uh, Franklin is an extraordinarily modern man. You have to only go to people like Nikola Tesla and Leonardo da Vinci. And I I, I'm open to other suggestions, but off the top of my mind, I can't think of anyone else. Einstein doesn't come close to Franklin. Franklin creates not just our understanding of the, that electricity is a par, that it is significant, that it exists in the world. He pioneers the specific technologies of electricity and everything that is done over the next 120 years until Clark Maxwell and then Tesla come along and Edison. Until those three giants come along 100 years later, there is no uh, every advance in electricity that Walter and Faraday and others make is basically just incrementally uh, crawling on the mountain that Franklin has already built. He is a pioneer of the most fundamental sciences in biology, as well as in physics, as in, as in chemistry. As we shall see, he is a pioneer in sociology and demographics. There is hardly anything that Franklin does not touch. By contrast, Newton really is a towering scientific genius, but in the last 30, 40 years of his life, he scientifically totally implodes. He becomes, if you would prefer it, an anti-Newton. This is not to say that the original Newton, the Newton of optics, the Newton of uh, 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 mathematics, the Newton of the Principia Scientifica, uh, Mathematica, uh, 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 is in, in uh, uh, enlightened man. He's a creep, He's a, but he's a fascinating human being. And of course, other great scientists have been creeps or murderers or alleged to be murderers or certainly have had kinks of their own. Freud himself openly, uh, him, we, we don't have to uncover the fact that Freud was experimented with cocaine and was addicted to it in his relative youth. He tells us this himself. He's perfectly open about it. And many of his early manic but uh, very brilliant ideas come to Freud when he's under the influence of cocaine. But if you look at Freud, you look at Franklin, 
you look at so many others, one does see an upward, up, upward and onward progression. With Newton, fascinatingly, as we shall see, we see the opposite. It is the second half of Newton's life when he becomes the acclaimed figure of the establishment in England and a key figure in creating and generating the very mindset of English intellectual life that dominate, runs England and dominates global scientific philosophy, unfortunately, to this day. When he becomes this powerful, controlling figure, the figure of not a of an evolutionary or dynamic conception of the universe and of, sci of scientific knowledge, but a figure of centralized, rigid, frozen, formal scientific knowledge. Newton starts as a religious heretic and he ends up as a scientific conformist. He creates the conformity and imposes it. And this is then replicated in geology, in biology, in sociology, and most of all, as we shall see, in free market economics, because Newton is the forebear of Adam Smith. Adam Smith is inconceivable without Newton and takes his central and harshest ideas and most relentless ideas on the free market and the immorality of any interruption with the remorseless work of the free market, even when it is crushing millions or hundreds of millions of lives. All of this is in Adam Smith and David Ricardo, and they get it all directly, as we shall see, from Isaac Newton. Now, the two men are also fascinatingly, per we start with the personalities, and they could not be more different. Newton, hardly ever knew his father, appears to have been a common laborer, is very close and dependent and at first on his mother, though he wants to get away from home, and he gets to Cambridge as soon as he can. He is an invert, socially and psychologically to the most extreme degree. He is very secretive about his personal life, but we are fortunate that it, not only does he have a, a, a very out, outspoken biographer in Stukeley, but one of the greatest minds of the 18th century, Voltaire himself, at the height of his powers, comes to England at the time of Newton's funeral and is fascinated by Newton because Voltaire worships Newton as the creator of the Enlightenment uh, and of rational in, enlightened modern world as Voltaire sees it. But because of this, Voltaire talks to people. He's actually by nature a great journalist and a great historian. Of course, he's a great writer, enormously productive, great pamphleteer. And he does what any good investigative journalist would do today. He talks to eyewitnesses and he gets a picture together of Newton. And he gets Newton basically right within limits, because there are huge dark areas of Newton that Voltaire does not even dream of. Voltaire hates the Bastille in France as uh, the embodiment of the darkness of the, of the French Inquisition of the Catholic Church and of a thousand years of centralized royal rule in France and of dark superstition. He does not dream to think that Newton has actually been for 30 years the master of the British equivalent of the Bastille. He is master of the mint, he is lord of the Tower of London, and Newton, as we shall see, prosecutes people and tortures them and kills them, not just legally, but personally. And he does not do so reluctantly. He enjoys doing it. He enjoys doing it. Newton has, uh, has no romance in his life and does not want to it. He appears to have, apart from his mother, and uh, at the very end of his life, he is looked after by a niece and her husband. Otherwise, there are no women in his life whatsoever. When Newton has a raving nervous breakdown in his 40s, he accuses another of the greatest scientists of the age, John Locke, of trying to destroy him. And how he alleges did Locke, one of the great enlightened figures of the era, seek to destroy him by embroiling me with women. Embroiling me with women. Enormously revealing. What would Freud have made of Newton? What would Freud have made of Newton? By contrast, when we look at Ben Franklin, we see a figure who is the antithesis of re repression. Newton, all his life, 
is a deeply religious man, but he's not a religious man channeled through the Catholic Church or the Church of England, which would have been vastly better for him because as established religions tend to be, they tend towards caution and moderation. They distrust excessive zeal and sanity. The Church of England to its great credit has been that way for at least since Archbishop Lord had his head cut off. Uh, teaching future bishops and archbishops the unwisdom and the dangers of taking politics too seriously. And that was already 360, 380, uh, almost years ago. No, Newton takes his theology very seriously. He, he, when we say he is a Christian, he doesn't believe Christ is God. He does not believe Jesus is part of the Godhead. He does not, he rejects the Trinity. In fact, he believes that the idea that Christ is God is a work of the devil. But he's also professor of Lucasian uh, mathematics at Cambridge University, which is still a very divine institution. And he therefore, in order to get on with his own career, he must hide his own heresy. So he is a master at hiding secrets all his life. Newton is not homosexual. It would be better for him if he had been. He's not, most certainly not heterosexual either. Neither of those things. And he is secretive. And he hides much more than his theology. Voltaire, it's hard to, in his innocence. Have you ever heard anyone call Voltaire an innocence before? Actually, now I think about it, I think you would think it's virtually impossible. But the most brilliant and even scathingly skeptical people, it's a human nature thing, we all have our blind spots. Voltaire idealizes Newton as the embodiment of rationality, of being the pioneer of an enlightened 18th century world where you can put God and Christianity and all the old dark religions aside and have a new world based on scientific enlightenment alone, and this will do the job. And it is Newton, bless him, who brought us there. Alexander Pope, later in the 18th century, writes one of his wonderful witty couplets uh, uh, about Newton's conceptual scientific achievement and uh, developing the concept of gravity. The, no, the universe was, I paraphrase a little here, so we, if you look up, no, back at this, but, but Pope is always better than anything one remembers of him. But it basically goes like this. The universe was bathed in, in, in chaos and night. The Lord said, let Newton be, and lo, there was light. And that is the way they saw Newton. One should add that 200 years later, uh, one of uh, uh, the great English physicist Eddington added a witty verse to, to this after he embraced Einstein, Albert Einstein's concept of uh, uh, theories of relativity. He said, the devil, loath to let a good thing go, said, lo, like, let Einstein be, and with a stroke restored the status quo. And with a stroke restored the status quo, we can be back in a world of chaos uh, and confusion where even real science or supposedly real scientific theories are so complicated that nobody can understand. Right now, in Newton's case, the, uh, many of the darkest secrets of Newton's life came out inadvertently to light 90 years ago. From another figure who is also, to put it mildly controversial, who is well known to all of you or almost all of you in this audience here, the English uh, progressive uh, ec economist and theorist, and not coincidentally, another died in the world Cambridge man. We will be focusing on Newton's side of the picture here enormously on the University of Cambridge. Again, a striking contrast we're going, we're going to see with Franklin. But uh, John Maynard Keynes, who married money and through uh, insider connections made a lot more and was also intellectually curious, bought up a lot of obscure Newton papers that had been buried in attics. They hadn't been deliberately covered up except by Newton himself. Nobody really knew what was in them, but there were literally millions of pages in them. And nobody gave a damn about them. But Keynes did. He was curious and he admired Newton enormously. And what did he find to his astonishment in these papers? They weren't about science at all. They were on two huge subjects. Alchemy, 
and Bible fundamentalism based on uh, calculations of prophecy um, on the end of the world, on the coming of the Messiah, in the book based on the book of Daniel. Now, the book of Daniel is one of the messiest books in the Bible. It is revered by Christian fundamentalists and Jewish fundamentalists in Israel, outside Israel, most Jews have even Orthodox ones have no time for it at all. They just don't get into it. It's not significant for them. But uh, he, I grew up in a fundamentalist society in Northern Ireland, took it far more seriously in my youth, in my 20s, than that, even into my 20s, and I'm embarrassed, I'm very embarrassed to say, than I remotely should have done. And it has a destructive effect on people. The book of Daniel drives its readers mad. Because if you take it seriously, you're going up every rabbit warren of absurdity for which there is no solution. And it wasn't even written at the time it's supposed to be written. Elements of it may go back that far. But we now know from history and archaeology that the empire of the Babylonians was not remotely the way it was in, described in the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel even gets the details and names of its main figures wrong. The Daniel, who's its hero, there is no independent evidence that he even existed. There are, there are of course, colorful accounts for him in Jewish tradition, but they may have come from hundreds of years later or be about a different kind of personality entirely. As best as we can tell, the real life Daniel, if he existed, was a horse trader dealing between Babylon and northern Syria who liked to, uh, as so many self-important twits do to this day, make himself out to have been a far more a significant figure in the big capital city of Babylon when he's out among the yokels in the boondocks. The now, and it's significant, you could say, it's the yokels in the boondocks, who are both Jewish and fundamentalist Christian, who've loved the book of Daniel ever since. But Isaac Newton takes the book of Daniel seriously. And one of the things Newton never gets into, of course, it's hundreds of years after his time, is the concept of programming and the concept of how computers work and data processing. And what is one of the first and central rules of data processing to this day? Garbage in garbage out my wife and elder daughter are both it engineers and i have had this hammered at me over the years endlessly and rightly so if you start with false premises and if you take stuff that is garbage and you base your calculations on that then lo and behold it doesn't matter how powerful your brain is or how brilliant you are or how remorseless your logic is, if your assumptions and basic data is garbage, all you will get is meaningless garbage. And Isaac Newton spends the last 40 years of his life in all his intellectual pursuits. He puts all his science aside and he, there is more of his paper. He leaves 10 million pages of papers behind him, 10 million pages, all of them handwritten. And more than half of them are about biblical prophecy and biblical chronologies, subjects that he either gets completely wrong or does not have the data to ever have a chance or dream of getting right. He, he abandoned, it's not, he, the first and greatest of physicists, as we are told, is also the, the worst of historians and archeologists. We are about to come to Ben Franklin, and we find a totally different personality, a totally different mind. Now, Newton also rises up in the center of intellectual life in Brit Britain and Europe. He, get, he is brought because of his precocious mind into the University of Cambridge at a very early age. He's still in his 20s when he becomes professor of Lucasian mathematics, as I said before, at Trinity College uh, in Cambridge University. And he really starts, and his, he has very good teachers there too, but one thing that is terrifying and brilliant and true about Cambridge is it can produce people of the most powerful philosophical influence and capabilities that you can even throw up your horror at, like Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein, but it does something else. You could not have the modern world without Cambridge. You could not have modern science and technology without Cambridge because it is where Rutherford eventually splits the atom. 
And Rutherford is the true father of the atomic bomb and of nuclear technology, far more than the theories of Einstein. If Einstein had never lived because of Max Planck and because of the physicists who follow Einstein, we would still have the, the one real contribution Einstein makes to that nuclear development, of course, is his famous letter, which Leo Schillard, in fact, wrote for him to President uh, Roosevelt, saying, my God, Mr. President, if we don't build this horrible, this inconceivable weapon, the Nazis will build it first, right? But you could, where does modern physics and modern uh, nuclear theory develop and come from above all else? It comes from the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. And where does molecular biology come from? Who founds molecular biology? Francis Crick and Jim Watson. Watson and Crick. Watson is actually even the more, they're both geniuses, but Watson is the more important of the two by far. And uh, uh, remains through all his life. He can, uh, um, if you read, uh, uh, he doesn't even present himself in this, but it's inescapable from looking at his biography and his autobiography. At every step of the enormous advances we have made into mapping the genome to this day, Watson, much more even than, than Crick, is the driving force. But my key point here is, uh, where are they? You find them in a couple of acres of tiny territory. The University of Cambridge is much more focused and narrow in its area than the University of Oxford, which is much more leisurely spread out and chaotic is. And this reflects the different backgrounds of both. Oxford is the city of history, uh, politics, messy compromise, cynicism. The British cynical, manipulative, indirect view of politics and of human nature, which is hugely realistic and practical, really comes from Oxford. Twice as many British prime ministers have come out of Oxford as have come out of Cambridge. And most of the ones who have come out of Cambridge have been embarrassing political failures. For the very same reason that science in Cambridge is so historically superior to science in Oxford. This, these are important, but goes back again to Newton. In Newton's case, therefore, we have an elitist at the heart of the English scientific and intellectual establishment at a, at a university which is already more than 400 years old when he goes there. And he is appointed to a, a key position. He soon becomes a key figure in the young new Royal Society for the Arts and Sciences that Charles II has founded right after uh, the, the restoration from the Comrelia Revolution in the 1660s. He has become a mover and a shaker. Then he has a nervous breakdown in the middle of his life, which we will come back to, and he becomes an administrator, a power monger. He is also a man who uh, is only socially uh, shy, is inadequate, per, in inter personal inter Here is a man with an IQ that is quite literally limitless, if it, if it was measured in conventional terms today. But his EQ, his emotional quotient, his emotional intelligence, is exceptionally withered and low. He never grows up emotionally. And of course, this is one of the reasons he hates Leibniz so much. And he produces an inf after the day. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, I only touch on this because Matt and Cynthia and your colleagues have done much more work on this than I have, and I, I fully agree with it and I admire it. But when it comes to the development of the calculus specifically, this is Leibniz. This is entirely Leibniz and much else in mathematics. But Newton, who has huge achievements in other areas, cannot sit back and say, it's not just me. Crick and Watson were both open in embracing each other and the great achievements they both made. Though the great crystallologist Rosalind Franklin drove them both crazy in the, their own lifetime. She died tragically young, uh, I think only in her late 30s, or early 40s. And interestingly enough, Watson, who we, we look upon as the lovable young fellow, was very cruel to her during her, their lifetimes, although he pays her a very generous tribute afterwards. But the great contemporary who showed her every personal consideration and kindness before she died was Francis Crick, who is commonly assumed to have a cruel, harsh humor, which he did to fools, but he didn't have to regard Rosalind Franklin as a fool. But we like to think of the Sherlock Holmes type figure, the tall, thin English guy as being the cynic 
uh, the, the cruel guy, the, the, uh, and the idea that Crip again defies the easy stereotype, defies uh, uh, the, the cliches and the archetypes, and that he was actually the one much more capable than the younger and witty uh, uh, Jim Watson of showing love and compassion and cur to a dying young woman. This we can't wrap our minds around. It, it, and similarly with Newton himself, the image of Newton, which Voltaire totally bought into, and was totally bought into not just until Keynes's day, but really till Frank Manuel brought out his classic biography of Newton in the 1960s. And the dating is important because as I've said before, I grew up in that era. And that was an era when the British Empire had just died, when Britain had been humiliated by the United States in the Suez Crisis of 1956, and when British intellectual life was split British, uh, uh, at this, and also it was close enough to the great bloodletting of World War I, which you see referred to an endless masterpiece theater shows like Downton Abbey and everything else ever since. I just caught last week, I think I was discussing it with Matt, uh, uh, a movie which I totally missed when it came out. And I, I it, it was panned when it came out in 2019, but I loved it. And it's a biopic about J.R.R. Tolkien, who was Lord of the Rings, and who had fought in World War I in the Battle of the Somme. And as Tolkien said in Major Life, Tolkien lived into his mid 80s, had an extraordinarily long, happy, and productive life at Oxford, incidentally, not Cambridge. Uh, was deeply, happily married for half a century, had four children, three boys and a girl, all of whom, you know, had long and happy and productive lives, all, all of whom he doted. But he started life under the worst circumstances. He was an orphan by the time he was the age of 10 or 12. Uh, he was brought up by a Catholic priest who was a close friend of his family, who was a kind and good man and was really a, a true second father to Tolkien, or, or the effect, his effective father in the best sense. But as a result of his Catholic background and because of his lack of wealth, he had a very difficult time. He was at first actually expelled from, uh, from Oxford from um, a combination of being uh, too rowdy in drinking parties with his friends and uh, 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 quote unquote lacking intellectual distinction. And this is the man who went on to be one of the greatest philologists of the English language. Uh, in history, and certainly at this century afterwards. So Tolkien starts life with difficulty, and then just when he's getting it all together, he's found the love of his life, he has close personal friends, he's got a, a career launched at Oxford, the University of Oxford with professors who revere him, World War I comes, and like any good, gallant, idealistic, honorable English boy, he goes off to fight for empire and idealism. And what does he find, of course? He finds bungling and butchery and hell. And as he himself says, by the time I was 25, all my closest friends but one were dead. Were dead. And this works its way out in The Lord of the Rings. And as I've written in a chapter of my upcoming, and uh, uh, one of my upcoming books, uh, if anyone is interested in this, let me know because I want to have some readers for it somewhere. Read this key chapter. I draw parallels uh, in the creative eight of life and genius and inspiration of Tolkien, and of the legendary Marvel comics artist Jack Kirby, who create did not create Spider-Man but created the X-Men, the Hulk, the Mighty Thor, and most of the other Marvel superheroes as well, along with Stan Lee. Kirby fought in World War II in Patton's Third Army, the same way Tolkien fought in World War I. And like Tolkien, uh, he suffered physically enormously. His legs were almost amputated. He late, later said, I only knew I was going to sit. My legs were not going to be amputated from frostback when their color started to turn from black to dark blue. Once my legs turned dark blue, I realized I had a chance of saving them, right? And this is a guy who goes on to draw kids' comics for the rest of his life. But as you will have gathered with a background like that, they are not ordinary kids' comics, right? Now, in the, the, the case of Newton, this trauma in his early life, too, of a different kind. Because, of course, you have the great play uh, uh, killing scores of thousands of people in London in 1666, when Newton uh, uh, is in his mid-twenties. And then you have the fire of London. What I will add here is this is our old friend catastrophism again on a human and historical scale within the human record. It's like the Blitz of 1940. 
But what is Newton's reaction to this? It is not a heroic reaction, it is a very significant reaction. It is to flee to Cambridge for the rest of his life, although he starts coming back to London for reasons we shall see in the 1680s when he undergoes a midlife radical personality change. Now, we, as we shall see in Franklin's case, there is radical personality change too, but in a very different way. Newton is mad. When Newton's personality changes, it's in a flash of lightning when he has a nervous breakdown in his early 40s. Uh, Franklin is not like that. Franklin is sane and stable and extraordinarily modern and enlightened in the best of ways. First of all, where Newton grows up in England starts as the son of a common laborer. Uh, Franklin's background is almost equally obscure, arguably more so. He's part of a large family. He comes from a poverty stricken, very unhappy home. He flees it as soon as he can. He runs to the city of Philadelphia at the age of 17. He starts working in a printing press operation. He's extraordinarily bright and talented. But within two years, at the age of 19, he visits London, the capital of the empire, for the first time at the age of 19. Now, this is of enormous importance because the image Franklin himself liked to give for very important political, diplomatic, patriotic and strategic reasons later in, his, later in his life. And it was a myth that he did not even create. It was not a lie. It was a myth in the most fundamental sense that Joseph Campbell understands myths to be. People need to believe archetypes. They needed to believe that the great, first great scientists from the Western Hemisphere, from the Americas, at a time when the Americas were totally still uh, uncivilized in European terms, must be uh, you know, Hawkeye of the wilderness or Chingachuk, a noble native or a noble ignorant American who is so simple and unaffected in his ways. Ben Franklin was never that way. He was a brilliant intellectual, a sophisticated guy. He was married by the time he was 24. He had met his wife and fallen in love with her when he was still a teenager. He was already a successful businessman in his 20s, and he was one of the most cosmopolitan people in Europe and the English speaking world before he was 20. He was already working and it was working class work, but he was coming from the colonies. He was going back to the colonies and he was already a skilled artisan, which in the economy of England in the 17th and 18th and up through the 19th century too, meant you were basically in modern American terms, middle class. You are basically middle class. You had disposable income. You could buy books. And in a relatively free society, you could, where your skills were in great demand, you could hold your head up high and talk even to wealthy, uh, wealthy gentlemen. And you learned how to talk to them and how to deal with them. And he was already learning this. And of course, when he goes back to Philadelphia at age 21, 22, it's like going back to the boondocks of the Appalachians or the Ozarks after spending two or three years in New York City in the 1920s. You're street smart. You're the wise guy. People come to you. If you want to, you can run rings around them. You're the smart kid. You're the rising star on the block. And Franklin leverages this. Franklin has the opposite kind of life from Newton. Newton is a sheltered, brilliant academic. He is such a brilliant mathematician sucked into the University of Cambridge at such an early age, he never has to deal with other human beings, he never has to compete with other human beings, he never has to look for jobs, he never has to look for a living, he never has to worry about making a profit, he never has to be a businessman, which eventually, as we shall see, he shall pay for in an enormous way towards the end of his life. He is not a practical man. And I can assure you, Oxford and Cambridge, more Oxford than Cambridge, uh, was very much that way when I was there in the 1960s and 70s. It has changed since, and I'll tell you when it changed. It changed when Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister of Britain, and her old university loathed her because she refused to give it a free financial run, as all previous Prime Ministers had done. And in revenge, they denied her an honorary doctorate of law, the only prime minister in modern British history to be denied an, an honorary doctorate from her own new, old university, especially Oxford or Cambridge, was Margaret Thatcher, which if nothing else speaks well of her, 
that should in a very big way and it's enormously revealing she believed in the free market and that people should earn their way in the world and although she herself had never had to actually but she believed in it with an evangelist's fervor and she imposed it on oxford and the more they tried to teach her like dirt the more she got off their funding but they were practical and so what did they do they adapted and you can even see elements of this in the inspector morrison inspector lewis british tv mysteries and public television because so many of the themes are brilliant professors in both the arts and humanities and in the science of oxford make new discoveries or breakthroughs somebody murders them for it or somebody murders someone else to keep the benefit of it for themselves and although the death count is much lower indeed not, almost non-existent in real life at least as far as I know, that it does catch the socio-economic reality of Oxford um, and Cambridge, since especially Oxford, since Margaret Thatcher put it through the financial ringer in the 1980s. But it is only then that they started to turn their brain power into working in the free market and attracting investment and thinking to pull in mo that money and investment in the Middle Ages, they understood this very well, but in, in the comfortable centuries of empire, especially under the Victorians, they forgot about it completely, and they wanted to forget about it completely. But of course, it's never been forgotten in Harvard, it's never been forgotten at Yale or, or Columbia or any other big schools in the East Coast. The big schools on the East Coast are more money-making and money-attracting uh, machines, even than the biggest and most corrupt monasteries and uh, religious institutions of the high Middle Ages ever were in terms of sucking resources into themselves and knowing how to do it and they're very good at that newton is part of that but he's a sheltered figure in it for his first 40 years so as, as we shall see he makes an interesting transition too but he never has to work in the marketplace franklin Dawes. franklin is more than that he is the first major newspaper tycoon in american history and in western civilized history he not only produces the best selling newspaper and pamphlet of the city of Philadelphia, it is not practical to have newspapers and news sheets simultaneously for all of the, the, the state of Pennsylvania, let alone for all the other colonies. Communications are still too primitive. There is no electric telegraph. Homing pigeons are a joke. Uh, you don't even have a Pony Express. The tracks on which the very badly uh, designed carriages with their huge wooden wheels of the day jolt between towns are a nightmare to, uh, uh, to sit on. But Franklin adapts to the challenge. He has a vision and he produces literally dozens of different local newspapers. If you even look in Wikipedia, the section on Franklin as a newspaper publisher and a newspaper man is enormous. Now, as I've said before, all his life, uh, Ernest Hemingway dines out on learning his style and the street smart such as they are. Really, he doesn't have any, but he, everyone falls for his fake macho boasting on being a veteran newspaper man who, who, who worked on the Kansas uh, uh, Evening Star before, you know, before he starts writing his books and goes to Europe. Well, he did for six months, six months. I've been a newsman and proud of it for 45 years now, and I got into the business late. Hemingway's a fake. Franklin is no fake. Franklin is one of the first pioneers of newspaper coverage in America and in the Western world. And he discovers who reads newspapers, what they want from it, what the economic foundation is, how you can attract advertising, how to attract a reader's base. Franklin even produces the first German language newspaper in America. It doesn't last long because other people steal the idea from him. And unlike him, they really are German Americans of the first generation. So they can write in better German to a German speaking audience in Pennsylvania than he can. And actually, like any good adaptive businessman, including Donald Trump, let us note, Franklin knows when to cut his losses, so he closes the German outfit down, but he goes on to start and successfully make profits from dozens of different small newspapers and pamphleteering operations. And eventually he leverages this into one of his biggest money makers, which is Per Richard's Almanac.
And like any publishing genius, he's like Henry Luce when Luce created Time magazine in the 1920s and Life magazine in the 1930s. Like Luce, hundreds of years later, Ben Franklin is a publishing and communications genius who sees the need for and the vision of a kind of publication and media outlet that everybody wants before it exists. And it makes him a fortune. Modest fortune, of course, he is never a billionaire, but he is already one of the wealthiest people in the city of Pennsylvania, of Philadelphia and the state of Pennsylvania in his 1920s and early 30s. He is a self-made man. He pioneers another American archetype. And this is at the center of, uh, from, uh, so we already have entrepreneurial talent, and it now leads to a generosity of vision and political talent that goes from this, because Franklin has first of all risen by enlightening the masses. He produces newspapers, he produces information, and he discovers that there's an appetite for this and an audience for it. And he is also at heart a generous man. He has many children, though most of them die tragically young at or just after childbirth. Ironically enough, his longest living child is born out of wedlock, his illegitimate son, William, and they are deeply close for the first 50 years of William's life until, as we shall see, a dispute about politics and ultimately philosophy too, drives them apart for the rest of their lives. And this is a tremendous heartbreak for Franklin. But again, you see another contrast with Newton. Newton is a strange isolationist creep. He does not interact with other human beings. Apart from his mother, he really has no family. He does not want a family. He has no girlfriends. He has no real boyfriends either. Newton is Newton. He does not have a life outside you know, the raw intellectual power of whatever he's turning to. And he lives in a mind of the a, a pure mind, which is very dangerous because you can imagine anything in your mind, whether it's true or false, it does not have to be grounded in physical or practical or common sense reality. By contrast, Franklin rises in reality. If he did not have done that, he would have starved. He is a printer, he works with his hands. He has to get on with the people who hire him and later on with the people who he hires. He has to negotiate as an equal with other businessmen to make deals, to make the profits, to get his newspapers printed and circulated and buy the material he needs. And of course, he's also a tinkerer. Newton's genius, and it is genius, is in the raw area of the mind. He is conceptually an Einstein. He thinks with his mind or Russell, I'm not talking about approving or disapproving of the ideas of either Russell or uh, Einstein, but in either case, you're dealing with people who basically live all their lives in their heads. But by contrast, Franklin, uh, or Clark Maxwell for that matter, by contrast, Franklin is like Edison or Tesla, either or both of them, or Howard Hughes, or the Wright brothers. He is making things. He is, he is an engineer. He is dealing with physical reality. And this is hugely important because of course it makes him the greatest inventor in America. It, the first of America's great inventors in the 18th century. The beginning of not just the great American entrepreneurial tradition, but also the great American physical mechanical invention tradition. Edison is a direct, out, Thomas Edison is a direct outcome of Benjamin Franklin and of the pragmatic approach to invention and mechanics that Franklin develops. And eventually, of course, he uses this to tame the lightning, which is only the beginning of his work on uh, uh, electricity. John Adams, who is no scientist at all, who is a, a much more a, an Isaac Newton figure, although he's happily married uh, and he has children and grandchildren. The children and grandchildren uh, are prone to depression and suicide uh, because they're as gloomy and doomy and judgmental on themselves as Adams, John Adams himself was. Adams would have been perfectly home had he been a believing communist as a commissar in the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 1930s. He is an enforcer. Now he's an enforcer for the good guys, 
which is why he doesn't do much uh, that much harm in the world. But he nearly wrecks the American Revolution by his own incompetence, as we shall see. And it is Franklin who has to save the, uh, the, the American Revolution diplomatically and strategically from Adams bungling in the crucial negotiations in Paris for the French alliance in the 1770s. And Franklin understands this perfectly, what, what the problem is and how to solve it at the time. And Adams, to the end of his life, never understands what he did wrong, that he did anything wrong, or that Franklin ran rings around it. The contrast between the two of them is utterly, utterly fascinating. Utterly fascinating. Franklin is a complex man in other ways, too. He is a slave trader and a slave owner in his 20s and 30s. But he doesn't stay that way. He genuinely evolves out of it. And for at least the last 40 years of his life, which is a long time, of course, he is the greatest abolitionist and champion of abolition of the evils of slavery in America. But that doesn't stop him from negotiating and cooperating in the interests of freedom for the American colonies with slave owners and, uh, like Jefferson and uh, uh, other, many others too, down south in Virginia and the Carolinas. So here is a man who grows into political and human decency at levels which he had not anticipated to when he starts out. And as we shall see, Franklin never stops growing. And there is another factor to Franklin, which is utterly fascinating. Franklin is much more of an Englishman and a patriotic Englishman than Isaac Newton is until he is at least 60 years, no, at least 50 years old, actually 55 years old. We can be very specific about the timing of this when it comes, actually age 60, very specifically. Uh, because the only he doesn't even begin to stir on this issue till the Stamp Act, and even then he does not dream that America must separate from Britain until he is uh, old enough in Britain and America today to be an old age pensioner. He would have been in the AARP for ten years before he became an American revolutionary. By con now, also this is a man. Remember, he's brilliant. He's gregarious. And in his 40s and 50s, he unexpectedly becomes one of the most important scientists in the world. He eclipses Isaac Newton because he discovers a force that Newton had never dreamed of. And that force is electricity, the famous kite experiment. It wasn't just a show off. It wasn't just an experiment. And it wasn't just an intellectual idea, as is always the case with Franklin. Genius insight, entirely new concepts of science and philosophy blossom from his head throughout his life, but they all come from the initial outgrowth of being an American businessman and self-made entrepreneur. He starts off from the most pragmatic and humane of reasons, and it takes him places he never, even he never dreamed existed. Because thousands of people are being killed a year throughout the, the civilized world, churches have high spires. Why they have high spires is a fascinating subject from theology and physics as well, um, and catastrophism theory, which I might go, if Matt lets me, I might go into with you on another future occasion. But they do. Ch why do churches have high spires? Who cares? The problem is they, ha they, they have high spires, and they usually have metal figures on the top of them, which attract lightning. And every year, devout Christians are killed by the thousand across Europe and England and North America when lightning strikes churches while bells are being rung or while services are being held. And it's an act of God. You know, nobody can do anything about it. Nobody questions it. Nobody questioned the fact that heart surgery was theologically opposed by fundamentalist Protestant historians in America into the 1940s and even into the early 1950s. And the very first surgeon at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, who successfully does this, is also an amateur carpenter, and he's never a formal do former doctor because he's a young black medical orderly. And he, he ends up being chief of surgery, surgery at Johns Hopkins, one of the most deservedly acclaimed doctors in the world, which speaks well to how far we came in a single generation. But he develops with a white, respected colleague, 
the techniques of open heart surgery. And because he's a carpenter in his spare time, he has to design the surgical tools for open heart surgery in the late 1940s to save the lives of young children. Because the very concept of open heart surgery has never been thought of by anyone else before, because it is regarded as tampering with sacred life given by God. And God will strike you dead if you try and save the life of a young child with heart problems rather than operating on their hearts. This attitude dominates American mainstream medicine into the early 1950s. And Franklin comes up against the same problem. He comes up with the first lightning conductor. This is why he flies the kite in the storm. He is saving thousands of people a year. And he is attacked by preachers in France and England and in the, the Americas, especially in the more devoutful parts of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, of course, uh, for uh, inter daring to interfere with God because He's taking away from God one of the main powers God has to keep mankind in a state of virtue, the ability to kill people unpredictably by lightning, when even when, especially when they are in churches. Right now, this actually fits with Franklin because, as I told you, uh, Isaac Newton is devout in his own dark, secretive, arrogant, elitist, twisted way all his life. He, he rejects uh, the divinity of Jesus. He rejects the Trinity, which, of course, has the advantage of meaning that only he, Isaac Newton, and a handful of other people know God's true plan in the world. Now, that's an idea that will automatically drive anyone crazy, but will also empower them very much, too. I once heard a wonderful uh, a psychiatrist explain to me uh, that the difference between a paranoid schizophrenic and a beloved religious mystic is much closer than people imagine. Both the religious mystic and the paranoid schizophrenic are convinced that they are the only creature in the universe that God cares about, that they are the center of all interest to the God of all creation. The only difference between them is the mystic is convinced that God will reorder all of the universe in reality for his or her personal satisfaction, whereas the paranoid schizophrenic is convinced that God is always going to manipulate the entire universe to trip him up and make a fool of him, that God's against you personally. The biblical writers of the Hebrew Bible understood this concept very well. There are two entire books in the Bible that deal with guys who believe that the Lord of the universe has gone out of their way to single them out and make fools of them or wipe them out. The book of Jonah, where the prophet hero finds that God is making a fool of him at every step of the way. And he never understands the concept of mercy or the concept of interaction with other human beings. The, the prophet Jonah is an Isaac Newton figure. He really, really is. By contrast, Moses the Liberator is, a, as we shall see, is a very Ben Franklin figure. He isn't. Uh, uh, ben Franklin doesn't start out as Moses the Liberator, but he, as we shall see, he surely gets there. And he doesn't even make any false turnings along the way. He develops slowly and he takes his time, but he most assuredly gets there. And he doesn't just part the Red Sea, he parts the Atlantic Ocean to bring freedom for the American people, as we shall see too. Another key point of Franklin is Franklin would have loved to have had a drink with Sigmund Freud. Newton would have run screaming a thousand miles to get away from Freud or any of his ideas. And this also tells you a lot. Franklin has been ludicrously placed in pious American life over the past 200 years as a great Christian and figure of God. He was never a Christian. He was always a, a, a free thinker. He was a Freemason from the, the early 20s onwards. And from the Freemasons, he seems to have taken two very fundamental concepts that were very crucial to his success, and neither of them has anything to do with Freemasonic ideology or the lack of it. The first is he's a sociable fellow. He's a club man. He likes, and you see this in London, Franklin always hangs out like Dr. Samuel Johnson in the coffee houses of London. He likes good company, and he likes good jokes, and he likes good wit. And in any democratic or even effective oligarchical society, you cannot get on without that. 
You cannot get on without that. I was surrounded at the University of Oxford in my years there, in my two degrees, with people of the highest imaginable intellectual capabilities, with no practical street smarts whatsoever. And they were a pain to communicate with as well. You find the same kind of people in Washington, brilliant autodidacts who will know the intricacies of any issue from balancing or unbalancing the budget to thermonuclear kill ratios and balances of terror and weight loads and the number of multiple warheads you can stick on the missile and this, that and the other, and how to keep track of all these things and we'll give you the most reliable intel and figures and revisions on them, on what we have and the Chinese have and the Russians have and everybody has or doesn't have off the top of their heads. And they are, it is impossible to do any business with them so they never get any higher than you know being basically glorified obscure clerks there was one fellow one of them an, an admirable man personally but he had no friends because he spoke like this all the time and very seriously and he never stopped for breath so you never had the excuse to end a conversation with him so if you were on the phone with him you were stuck on the phone with him for three hours when you simply wanted to ask him what the time of day was now you have no idea how horrific it is to have to contact someone like that for information, knowing that you can get the information in 30 seconds and they will take three hours out of your life. Newton had that negative quality to him. Franklin liked people, was interested in them, liked their jokes, was interested in their foibles. And he, as I say, he was a club man. And there was a second thing he got from the Freemasons. And this is an insight which has been popularized by the, one of the greatest of anthropologists, Margaret Mead. And Margaret Mead said, you can do any, one person can achieve nothing in the world. But a handful of people, just a handful, five, 10, 20 people to start with as a society can change the whole world if you are motivated to do it and you go out to do it. And 200 years before she lived this and observed it, you find this in the work of Benjamin Franklin. Franklin in America, in England, later in France, is capable of changing, transforming societies and the way they conceptualize the whole world over long periods of time. He plays a key figure in creating what is the most unexpected political uh, constitutional masterpiece in history the constitution of the united states and of course he has and he passes on to jefferson and others the extraordinary insight that there's a living dynamic and ultimately democratic uh instrument responsive to, uh, to the development of society and the development of people in society the constitution must never be complete it must never be closed off and he takes this to his views of science as well he develops, uh, uh, there are two biographers, before we jump to the second half of this lecture, and Matt, I'm going on as too long as always, tell me when to slow me down. But uh, Franklin uh, is, at, when Franklin, Franklin's experiments with electricity are not just limited to developing lightning rods. Uh, the best overall biographer I have found on Franklin, he's popular, he's readable, he doesn't ch channel, uh, uh, challenge any conventional wisdoms, but he's a beautiful writer and he's totally reliable on, on what he writes, uh, is Walter Isaacson, who significantly enough also did a biography of Henry Kissinger that Henry loathed. There was actually a reason for it. The, the, the Kissinger biography is very sympathetic to Kissinger by and large, though not uncritical of him. I mean, it points to Kissinger's, wart, Kissinger's warts and all, but that wasn't uh, uh, what, what, what Walt's great, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, transgression was in Henry's eyes. He relates the gossip that when Henry married his second wife and was running around to Europe with her uh, uh, in the 1970s, it was more for show and for practice than those days before Viagra. Uh, he wasn't that active anymore. And whether that is true or not, Henry never forgave him for putting that in the biography. And that's important too, because as we'll see with both Franklin and with uh, Newton in different ways. 
personal slights, even in the most legendary of figures, in fact, especially in the most legendary of figures, we tend to look on people like Church, uh, Churchill and others as godheads. Churchill, of course, was eager to do that. FDR was much more accessible because FDR never really made the mistake of taking himself seriously, which is why I think he remained sane to the end and happy to the end and so successful even to the very end. He had a large family around him and like Franklin, he had girlfriends when his wife couldn't deliver, not the, even the physical goods, but the emotional goods anymore. Now, in Franklin's case, we find him in his 20s, in his 20s, Franklin already writes an article, advice to a young man on how to take a mistress. And his advice superficially is very conventional. And it says, well, you should really marry because the, he's really a proto-Freudian. He says the sexual urge in humanity cannot be denied and cannot be repressed. So in order to keep society healthy and to avoid having jealous lovers and husbands coming after you to kill you, get yourself a nice young wife early, like I did. Now, of course, uh, this is written in such a simple, frank state that the pamphlet remains largely suppressed to this day, because the image has to be created by later generations that Franklin and Washington uh, and all, most of the founding fathers were good, devout, Bible-thumping Christians. Now, they were deists in the deepest sense. They were deeply religious and moral men. But they did none of them believe in conventional Christianity of any form, nor did Abraham Lincoln. I've told before a famous story, totally documented, where Lincoln, already known as one of the most outspoken and skeptical free thinkers in the state of Illinois, is running for Congress in 1846, and he wins that election. And he turns up looking for votes at a Sunday morning, you know, religious meeting with like several hundred people, if not a thousand or more present, because, you know, you don't have television or radio or many newspapers or anything, that was the way to reach people, to go out to the saloons and the, the, the churches, wherever they were gathered, right? And the, pre the preacher there recognizes Lincoln and knows that Lincoln is one of his intellectual arch enemies and skeptics. And he's preaching fire and brimstone and the fires of hell, right? And he says, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? Which one of those two are you going to, Mr. Lincoln? And Lincoln replies, well, I don't know about you, uh, uh, reverence, but I'm going to Congress. Think about that a minute. It's wonderful wit. Exactly. Now, that's the kind of man George Washington himself was. And it's the kind of man Ben Franklin was. It is not the kind of man as we shall see John Adams was. And it is certainly not the kind of man Isaac Newton was. Basically, Newton felt everybody would go to heaven. But the far lower working class, you know, chambers in it, while well, he would be up there in the Unitarian heaven, first class. He was an elite. Uh, he, uh, Cambridge made him an elitist. But he, he, uh, his own religious obsessions made him an elitist. And his lonerness made him an elitist. Newton never has a sense of responsibility for society. He certainly never has any concept of raising up the, the, the peoples of society, of raising up standards of living or reducing human suffering. This is central. This concept of raising, relieving human suffering, increasing human happiness is central to uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin's life all his life. Now, from 1755 to 1774, this extraordinary genius opens up yet another window in his life. There is a phrase that Lord Clarendon uses to describe the genius of Oliver Lincoln, oh, sorry, of Oliver Cromwell, a figure who in fact ultimately absolutely loathes, but he respects his towering, from his point of view, frightening stature. For, for Clarendon, who was close to King Charles II, Cromwell as a figure as terrifying as Hitler or Stalin would be to us. And he said, but he, he recognizes Cromwell as a political towering figure. And he says, here is this man who seemed to be an ordinary routine gentleman farmer and country squire until he was 40 years old. And 20 years later, he's one of the most powerful human beings on earth. He is the creator of the British Empire and the Lord Procurator of Britain, right? And conqueror of the nations of Western Europe whenever he cares to do it. And how does he explain this? Clarendon says, uh, about Cromwell, he he appeared to grow new facilities as the, uh, as the, as the requirements for them arose. Whenever a challenge came up, 
He simply rose to the challenge and showed levels of ability and capability nobody dreamed he had had before, and he did not dream he had himself. Now, on this one, I refer to any of you here who have not seen or even forgotten or haven't forgotten because I just like to be we rush myself the lecture I gave uh, for bless you Matt for, uh, for you in rising tide on General Grant a man who appeared to be a total mediocre failure in the world until he was nearly 40 years old and he goes from in uh, about the age of 37 when he literally does not have a pair of shoes he can wear without holes in them to three, four years later, he is Lieutenant General of the armies, commanding all the entire armies of the United States, a position uh, 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 that only George Washington has held before him. And he goes there from having no shoes on his feet in four years. And as I said, nothing like this has been seen in history before. But what you then see, as you see when he is president, and then when he tours all the great courts, not just of Europe, but of Asia and the world, China, Japan, Russia, Grant never stops growing. And we see this with Franklin in an even more spectacular way. What does he do when he sails to and from the across the Atlantic? An Atlantic voyage in those days is very dangerous. And it's very long. It takes two months each way. A large number of people died of seasickness on the trip. During the Irish famine in 1847, 500,000 Irish immigrants died on the ships from typhus or seasickness from the disease, having been weakened by the famine, and their bodies had to be thrown into the ocean. And to this day, you find President Joe Biden refers to this in his second in his inaugural speech uh because he's scranton irish his great great grandfather came over on a coffin ship and he casually refers to it it would have been missed completely in england but the uh, um, uh by now most american irish might have forgotten it too but in boston they won't have forgotten and he refers to black 47 the coffin ships of black 47 and atlantic crossing was incredibly arduous incredibly dangerous benjamin franklin makes eight of them in his life the first when he is 19 years old, the last when he is in his 70s or close to it, as makes no difference. And on the last one, he's in danger of being intercepted by the British Royal Navy and hanged as a traitor, and he still does it. But he keeps himself busy during these trips. What does he do for a hobby? What does a man like Franklin do as a, for a hobby? Well, there's no Nintendo, right? There's no Rubik's Cube to play with. And although he plays cards, you know, he's been, that, that's old news for him for 60 years now. He creates the science of oceanography. He maps uh, the currents of the Atlantic. He discovers the Gulf Stream. This is the kind of man we're dealing with here. Truly a Renaissance man, a Renaissance man with 18th, gifts of 18th century technology given to him that uh, Leonardo could not even have dreamed of, that make Leonardo's dreams come true. You can implement Leonardo's dreams. If you have 18th century technology, you can map the world. You can lay the basis for modern medicine. And Franklin does all of these things and he recognizes and this is central to your understanding if you are in an empire empires grow but then once they have grown they tend to stall and freeze the powers that be want to keep what they have this tendency is already clear in england in the 18th century ironically enough the american revolution renews the british empire because the british lose their main empire and therefore be wanting an empire and being aggressive, confident carnivores with modern military technology, they go out and get an even, make an even bigger one for themselves. They lose America, they take Australia. They're beaten in America, they conquer India. You see where this is going, right? But in the 19th century, by the time of the Queen Victoria, the English just want to keep their empire. They know they're being outstripped by, for all their efforts. Germany and Russia and the United States are all finally breaking free of their long domination and are outstripping them. And even though they do everything they can, 
and we know what many of those dirty tricks are, to turn the clock back. This sense that we are no longer the supreme masters of the universe is found throughout British society. Again, I recommend a wonderful book on this, written from a very pro-British empire point of view, uh, which makes it all the more revealing. The collapse of British power by C Lord Corelli Barnett, B-A-R-N-E-T-T. And incidentally, we are repeating the same mistakes in America now because I cite that book often in lectures to very high level military audiences. And I always make this point to them. When you read The Collapse of Military Power, uh, The Collapse of British Power by Corelli Barnett, visualize the following. Everywhere you see the word England or Britain, cross it out and replace it with the United States. Everywhere you see the word Germany written, cross it out and replace it with Russia. Everywhere you see the word Japan written, cross it out and replace it with China. And that is the dilemma that we today, as the British before us, are painting ourselves into a corner of, simply because we cannot let go of the idea that we are still the divine hyperpower, and we do not realize that the more we try and rule the whole world, the more we guarantee that the rest of the world will rise up and throw us over. The concept, history does not repeat itself, but the concepts in history repeat themselves. The principles in history repeat themselves. And Franklin takes advantage of this, and the, the, the global balance of power to win freedom from America in the 1770s. But why win freedom from America? He has no conception of it when he goes to be, uh, 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 the. He, remember, this is one of the most eminent, admired, influential figures in the state of Pennsylvania. And each major state in the nation was a nation or world unto itself then. You did not have turnpikes even linking up the whole East Coast. You are still 18 years to 100 years away from having the first network of railroads binding to, uh, together America. There is no conception of speed of light communications in the electric telegraph. To be uh, a member of Philadelphia society is to be a member of uh, London or Paris on a small scale. It is a mini nation in itself. You are not playing second uh, fiddle to Boston or to New York or to Charleston because each of those cities are basically national centers psychologically and culturally in themselves. And this is what Franklin comes from and is used to. He is sent over as the agent, basically the, uh, a combination of uh, 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 chief economic negotiator and separate ambassador from the nation of Pennsylvania to the imperial court in London to represent and pursue the interests of the state of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania within the British Empire. 1755. And as best as we can tell, he, not, does, he is proud of doing this. There's no question about that. And there is not the slightest hint that he is looking for independence for Pennsylvania, let alone for the whole East Coast. He is an American Englishman and proud of being English, proud of being British. And we do not, again, as I said before, Franklin is a stable soul, unlike Newton, whom we shall soon come back to. Newton has a sudden flash of lightning, radical personality transformation, and not for the better in his 40s. Franklin never has that. He's too stable for that. But he does gradually and incrementally change. And this is hugely important. And we see his change in his conversation, in his voluminous correspondence, in his records of, of, of talks with so many other people. As a fine businessman, an ambitious genius with vision who sees the entire North American continent in front of him, he is central and passionate in helping England win the Seven Years' War. Because after the Seven Years' War, he visualizes unlimited growth and expansion and prosperity and population growth for Pennsylvania and Philadelphia and for all the societies of the Eastern Seaboard. And he's right, of course. But then he discovers a much more formidable enemy to the growth and prosperity of the American peoples is growing, uh, 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 um, American settler peoples is, has grown up in front of his eyes without him realizing it before. The very nation that he has been loyal to all his life, the English crown. He and Washington after him has the same experience. 
present very ambitious settlement plans for the Ohio Valley and for developing lands to the West. But the lords and grandees of the British Empire laugh at him, just as they will laugh at Washington afterwards. Their primary concern is that, uh, uh, remember, this is the, uh, the era of both the William Pitts. It's the era of saving money and low taxation when the Whigs are in power. You do not want a large army. You do not want wars, which sounds good. But that in turn means you don't want the Indians raising wars on the frontier. And if more white settlers flood in, the Indians will rise up. So the English back the Indians as allies. They take over the Indians as allies from the French because they want a quiet life. And they block the expansionist plans of the settlers. But the settlers must expand for demographic and economic reasons, as Franklin sees clearly. First, in the South, their primary crops are cotton and tobacco which exhausts the earth. And this is central to the expansion of slavery, which we can see in other lectures later, and to the success of Andrew Jackson's policies, civil war. Because in all, uh, uh, because you are exhausting not just the poor black slaves, but also the land, we have to find new land to grow new profitable crops of cotton to the old land. And this particular conundrum is eventually solved, but not until slavery has, 70 years after slavery has been abolished, when Henry A. Wallace, the greatest of all American secretaries of agriculture, uh, develops and uses the federal power to develop rotational crop management to replenish the soil on a continental scale during the New Deal. And much of the key pioneering work for this was done by the greatest of all American plant agronomists, George Washington Carver, who had to fight uh, uh, because he was African American, of course, they denied his genius, the idea that he was capable of adding one and one to make two, apart from being arguably the most influential and important uh, agronomist in, uh, uh, and plant breeder in human history at least till Norman Borlaw came along. But Franklin foresees this problem. Therefore, he foresees westward expansion is essential for the continued prosperity in both of the economies, colonies. And secondly, he is the first great modern demographer. And unlike Malthus, he is an optimistic one. He is producing calculations that an American society with a population of one million people less than one million people when he is born in his own lifetime will become an enormous power wealthier than all the nations of europe combined with a population of 100 million people and more and he is doing these calculations in the first half of the 18th century based on exact existing figures of population growth but he draws the opposite conclusion from malthus Malthus says there is no expansion in human society, no expansion in the universe, and he has no conception of developing uh, advanced technology to increase human prosperity and human food growing and sustainability capabilities. Malthus is a total ignoramus of science and technology and agriculture. Now, Franklin would be the first to claim that he has no knowledge of those things in this very self-deprecating way which of course is another American style we later see in uh, uh, Mark uh, Twain and many other great American writers and philosophers pretending to be dumb when you're not. Franklin even pioneers this. But what Franklin recognizes and is the first great American thinker to recognize, again, is what Edison sees after him. And of course, Tesla. And even Ford before Ford goes mad for Hitler. And that is technology changes everything. Technology opens all doors. We do not have to submit to a mouthless future. We do not have to cull our population or keep our population in, in poverty or even the British solution in Ireland and intended to be in America to uh, inflict political stability through starvation and genocide on your subject populations which was a key element of the British Empire from Queen Victoria, no, from Queen Elizabeth I, all the way through the Bengal famine of the 1930s, of the, of the mid-1940s. 
in the British Empire as a matter not of claimed conspiracy theory or this or that or obscure papers, but as a matter of re demographic records, as a matter of demographic record. And Franklin is overthrowing that Darth dark orthodox you know, Malthus before Malthus is even born. But what this steadily, he makes another discovery in London. Remember, what's the real secret of a great scientist? It is not to be a Newton. It is not to come out with great conceptions mathematically in your head, whether it is Einstein or Newton. It is to keep your eyes open and look at the world around you and see what is there and what is not there. One of my favorite modern comic books is the Astro City series by the great writer Kurt Busiak. And he has a sub-series in which he has his own version of Sherlock Holmes or Batman with a dark secret of his own, which I don't want to give away for you because you should read the comic book for yourself. The, the book is called Confession. It's just a sheer joy. And the hero is a Sherlock Holmes type detective. And he, his secret hangout is in the huge uh, 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 fog-covered, gloomy cathedral in Astro City. And that's where he has a secret cave, his bat cave or his confessor cave, so to speak, from which he wages his relentless war and crime. And just as Batman has Robin, uh, the confessor uh, adopts a boy sidekick to be his, you know, disciple and eventually successor. And he calls him, therefore, Alter Boy, right? Instead of Batman and Robin, you have the confessor and Alter Boy. But he's teaching Alter Boy because he's a, a, a sound Catholic Christian, as well as being a Sherlock Holmes det deductive detective, he teaches principles of logic and reason from Francis Bacon. And one of the things he teaches, and we find this in uh, Ben Franklin, look for the anomalies. Look what everybody believes to be true. Look for the anomalies that don't fit the broader picture. Why are they there? What causes the anomalies? What is wrong with the general picture and theory that it cannot account for the anomalies? Base your deductions on that. That's what the confessor says. And this is what Benjamin Franklin does when he's in London. Because he goes to London loving London and loving England as the font of civilization, the root from which the wonderful society and free society of free men and women living in modest prosperity with unlimited hopes and futures in the colonies come from. Because England made it so, he imagines. And then he goes to London. And he discovers that the London society he discovers is totally different from what he had imagined it to be. It is far vaster. Less than a million people, a million, a society of less than a million white Englishmen live on the entire, on an area of the East Coast uh, way, uh, and even though they're crammed in, they don't dream of meeting, meeting the Mississippi River, but they're still spread out over an area larger than Western Europe. And in London, in an area not much bigger than uh, than the county district areas around Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, you already have more than a million people going on to two million by that time living. One of the greatest concentrations of humanity on the face of the earth at that time. And there are people living in levels of indescribable wealth and resources, such as no, not even the wealthiest planters in the colonies would have dreamed of or aspired to. And there are also hundreds of thousands of people living in the most dire and horrific poverty, which uh, Franklin could not have conceived of reading descriptions of hell in the Bible or listening to preachers. And this shocks him. It shocks him. But then it gets even worse because around 1770, Franklin does a grand tour of his own. Now, the conventional grand tour, which Franklin is also familiar with, which I did in my 20s as well, and repeatedly since then, is for, you know, you provincial bright little kids from England or Ireland, you know, go to France, see the Louvre, go to the Uffizi uh, Art Gallery in Florence, go to Venice, yay, wonderful. We were there for, uh, on, on our honeymoon. We went there for our 25th anniversary. I never tire of going back to Venice. My wife feels that any foreign travel not to Venice is foreign travel wasted. And I, I can buy that. But Franklin does the opposite. His grand tour is to the most destitute, remote, pain in the ass parts of the British Isles. 
He visits northern Scotland, where the, which has been depopulated of Highlanders deliberately by state policy since 1745, a quarter of a century before. And he sees the indescribable poverty and population pressure of the peasants in, the, in Ireland who only eat potatoes, that, which thankfully at that time still grow because they cannot afford to buy anything else. They cannot afford to buy potatoes either, they have to grow their own. And he, it make, and he, remember, he's already been in London for more than a decade. And Frank, Ben Franklin starts to ask himself a question which frightens him. And he acknowledges this. And he, and he writes this down. He says, and this is a huge part of the, of the moral and political and philosophical growth of Benjamin Franklin. Will the policies that were deliberately used to create such an extraordinarily widespread suffering in the interests of the center of empire and of wealth and of capital in London that were inflicted on the peoples of the north of Scotland and Ireland who were defenseless against them and could not fight back and could not defend themselves? Why, when we live in our happy cottages and security and little farms in New England, in Pennsylvania, and in the Carolinas, of course, he, even there, having been a slave owner himself and slowly coming around, in fact, uh, liberal policies in Britain help enlighten him as to the ultimate moral evils of slavery, because England does abolish at least the legal trade in slavery in 1778, rather than everything else with the history of the British Empire. There is an enormous amount of hypocrisy and self-interest involved with this. But in a way that, we can go into that later if you like, but it is actually per peripheral to our central concern. And that is Ben Franklin is horrified at what he sees in the Highlands, horrified at what the suffering, human suffering he sees in Ireland, and he starts asking himself, first of all, do I, living as happily and as comfortably as I do in the Americas, can I afford to turn my back on such human suffering and be oblivious to it? The mark of the righteous human being through all ages. And then he goes further, and it's a much more frightening thought. Can this strike home to us? I left a, an unhappy house at age 17. I came to the city of Philadelphia. I became a skilled tradesman already at 17. I could earn my own way in the world. I could eat three full meals a day and pay for comfortable lodgings. I had drink. I had friends. I enjoyed my life. I had bright prospects ahead of me. What will happen to us in America if the same power that has inflicted such suffering so deliberately and relentlessly for a ge generations in the case of Scotland and for centuries by this point on the peoples of Ireland, turn their interest to New England. And my God, they are starting to do so. They are imposing taxes on us. And I now see that this is precisely through the imp imposition of excise that they have the power to prevent in, interest, in, in industry from developing in Ireland as it is doing in the canals of England. They have the, he sees, which the Cato idiots and free marketers do not see to this day, that governments always use economic power, whatever they claim to do it, in the interest of making some regions richer, some regions poorer, and most of all, the government and its self-interested supporters richer above all. He sees this, and he also sees we are the next in their way. Up to now, you see, he thought, the English refusal to allow American settlement west of the Allegheny Mountains all the way to the Ohio River Valley. It's just a misunderstanding. He's a rational man. He's read Voltaire. He believes in the Enlightenment. He's the greatest scientist of the generation following Newton, and he knows this, and he's being acknowledged generously for this. So surely, and it's the great liberal delusion to this day, surely if everyone is rational and well-meaning, all these unfortunate conflicts can be peacefully and sensibly resolved by sensible people. But what happens when sensible people decide their self-interest lies in banging you over the head or killing you or impoverishing you? And this is what Franklin comes up against. And 
eventually things come to the boil in the city of Boston with the Boston massacre, I think what, 1771, 1773. And uh, in order to crack down on Boston, the, uh, the English crowd, the, uh, the governments of King George III, impose martial law on the city of Boston. Now, this is not universally unpopular in the Americas because the Americas are already a divided society by this time. Uh, the North is fighting for freedom, but the slave owners of the South have no sympathy for the North because they're, all, they're already too liberal and too opposed to slavery for their taste. As we shall see, the South does go through a half century of relative liberalism from the 1770s to the 1820s, but it really doesn't last beyond that and there are powerful forces uh, from outside, from England especially, supporting the slave forces from that. And you know this very well from your own scholarship and your own research. But up to this point, Franklin has been naive. He is a, not an American. He is an American colonist and a proud Englishman of the Americas. And all we have to do is resolve these unfortunate understandings between us. And then economic growth can go on and we can go on kowtowing our head and I can become uh, Sir Benjamin or Lord Franklin and it's gradually brought home to him. First of all, he's a country bumpkin. Actually, I discovered this uh, half a century ago as well. I was much, uh, being Jewish was no problem, but I was far too Irish. I was far too outlandish and colorful. Not even for uh, wealthy or established English people who feel threatened, but for uh, middle-class Lon Northwest London Jewish snobs. No, no time for me. Whoa, forget about it. You could not be, I could not be taken seriously. You come to America, nobody cares what your background is or Canada at its best. But in my time, even while general British society was as tolerant and generous as it, as it has ever been, and that's saying a lot, it was admirable. But in my own mini community, I came across prejudices against me as a dirty Irishman that I would not have dreamed would be inflicted on anybody who was Jewish or African-American or what have you. But there they were, and I have no doubt there they still are, among jerks, of course, but there they will be. And Lincoln, sorry, not Lincoln, later Washington, but first of all, very definitely Franklin, comes across this. Franklin goes to the Duke of Newcastle. He goes to former prime ministers of England, to the Earl of Boot. He goes to great figures who are movers and shakers and says, I can multiply your fortune by the factor of 10, which being Franklin, he could certainly have done. I can give you lands in America to be run at profit that are larger than the Duchy of Burgundy uh, or the original Kingdom of Castile in Spain or France. Oh, yes, of course, Dr. Franklin, you're just another of these country bumpkins from America. Pat the poor fellow on the head and send him on his way with something from the kitchens, will you, Saunders, you know? He's treated like the outside guy, at, you know, the outside help brought into uh, Downton Abbey. Incidentally, my late father loved to watch those shows because in Ireland, when he was growing up, he wasn't downstairs in Downton Abbey. Downstairs looked down on him. He was a piano tuner who came in on his push bike through the wind and the rain from 40 miles away in the city of Cork to the greatest English estates of the area to tune their pianos. And from his point of view, then the people who were working as scullery maids and chimney sweeps in the great houses were incomparably wealthier and grander than he was as a teenager or even into his 20s. Now, but before he died, he, there was upward mobility even in Ireland, maybe especially in Ireland. Once the English were kicked out, my father became a successful businessman, not his own, maybe he became a, 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 a very successful executive in a, a, a major uh, British uh, fur, furniture and dry, uh, dry goods chain, a Macy on a smaller scale, a Macy's equivalent, if you will. But that was how he started out. And Franklin realizes here is this man, a self-made businessman. Today, in equivalent dollar terms, he would certainly be worth 100 million bucks or so in his general holdings. A man who had prospered in every business dealing that he ever did. And he's treated as a country bumpkin. And worse than that, his fellow Americans are being shot in the streets by the British army. 
And he suddenly sees an anti-American prejudice of people who've never been to America in their lives. These useless parasite, hardly Americans. We saved their, their scalps from the French and the Indians. Actually, of course, the Americans did that themselves. The British were terrible soldiers in the wilderness, as Washington saw at first hand when they didn't take his wise advice and got slaughtered by the French and the Hurons in the 1755 war in upstate New York. And uh, Franklin knows the truth of all of this and instead sees these vile, ludicrous libels. And at one point, he writes to an old British friend, a liberal friend, a politically sympathetic friend, but he is English and he supports the rights of the crown. And what does Franklin write? And this is around 1774, 75. For all the warmth of our association over so many decades, I paraphrase slightly here, but of course, Franklin, like all the great 18th century wordsmiths, puts it in comparably better. But I paraphrase, try to do a little justice. Uh, sir, we have been the warmest of not merely acquaintances, but friends for, for uh, many years now. But I must, with, with, with uh, the heaviest of heart, say to you that your con continued uh, insensitivities to the suffering of my fellow countrymen make it impossible that our association can possibly continue. You are sincerely, Benjamin Franklin, my fellow countrymen. He isn't an Englishman at the, in the Americas anymore. He has become an American. And when he goes back to America, there is huge distrust of him because in the past he has always opposed the champions of independence either for Pennsylvania or for all the colonies. He has actually become more radical and braver and more clear in his own eyes on the need for full independence than the old firebrands were. But it takes years for them to come around to this. By the time of, uh, of 1776, and of course, the, the writings about this, uh, the popularizations about this are actually relatively accurate. I personally love the musical 1776, in which while I compress some things for reasonable time and put into some very embarrassingly bad song and, da song and dance, the actual arguments and the dynamics of the arguments are realistically put realistically put now as usual i talk on for far too long and I, i'll turn now to finish up on newton before hopefully we have time for a few questions and discussion um, if not i apologize to you matt but in as we see here with franklin franklin never stops growing and actually there's one area i have to stay with franklin first because it's so fascinating and extraordinary and secondly it fits the sense again franklin underst is an extraordinary open-minded man he is not a big bang man. He has never, as far as I can tell, ever been a Bible fundamentalist. He has always been a free thinker. And that means since there was no start to the universe, there can be no death to the universe. And that means the universe is infinite and open-ended. Therefore, economic growth and expansion continue. Or as we would say in modern terms of physics, there is no necessity in the physics of Jim and Franklin for the heat death of the universe. And therefore, you can still grow. And he himself reveals this in his own life. He, as an individual, never stops growing. He grows more and faster and better the older he gets. In 1777, when war has begun, Franklin risks his life again, and he will certainly be hanged, drawn, and quartered, hanged from the neck, and his body's torn open by instruments of torture while he is still conscious and alive and then his limbs cut off from his body this was civilized english legal procedure into the 19th century to only about 200 and less years ago and franklin risks this when the most powerful navy in the history of the human race the royal navy at the time is blockading the americas and he risks his life to sail to france because he knows that America cannot win its war without a major superpower ally. Does this sound modern, contemporary, 20th century, 21st century, balance of power, the needs for small nations looking for freedom, to have larger nations to protect them or finance them or arm them? You see how incredibly far ahead of his time Franklin was. And Franklin creates the tradition 
And for 100 years, it is an extraordinarily successful, 50 years, hugely successful, pragmatic tradition of American diplomacy. And again, he does so by be appearing to be what he is not. Franklin is a most sophisticated man. He has visited London for long periods, for four periods in his life, including a 20 year period. He has been an honored member of the most eminent intellectuals and scientists in London and Birmingham. He is a driving figure in the Lunar Society with Dr. Priestley. They have openly discussed the possibility of biological life on other planets of the solar system and further out in the universe and what form it will take. Uh, they are the most rational of people. And he is, the, he is the man who has developed, not just discovered you can tame lightning, it is not just a divine force. He has come up with the laws of lightning. He has invented the first batteries technology. We could do with him today when we desperately need batteries to be upgraded, to be more effective in our battery run cars, which is the great limitation on electric uh, 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 powering cars to this day. And what do we need? We need somebody to question the fundamentals that we are trapped in in that technology as well, and Franklin was always that way. But this is not the, the way he is seen when he comes to France. When, when Franklin is in London, he dresses impeccably. There are many impressive paintings of him wearing golden prince nails, wearing a wonderful stylish 18th century blue suit with gold and scarlet trimmings. Uh, uh, he is a, uh, a uh, he, he can be a, 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 a fashion horse and enjoys it. But he finds in the Amer in Paris, they love the idea that he is a simple rust. He is Hawkeye in the later romances of terribly written romances of James Fenmore Cooper. He is the simple countryman, the honest bumpkin, the guy who isn't very bright, but I tell my truth. And this remains an enormously potent figure in America to this day. Joe Biden plays a version of this. So did Donald Trump. His version being from the work, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the local, I mean, he, Trump is a billionaire, the son of a multimillionaire. But his self-image is, of, well, you know, I'm just a, a, a working guy from Queens who likes to help out with the World Wide Wrestling League, right? And of course, you don't see this in Franklin Roosevelt, but you, you, you see it in Eisenhower, a brilliant, subtle intellectual who was one of uh, 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 an extraordinarily accomplished Washington insider and planner from the 1930s onwards, uh, the right hand man of the chief of staff of the United States Army for a decade through the 1930s when he was still only a major. But Eisenhower liked to come across as a simple fellow who just liked to read Westerns. And the New York liberal intellectuals were so stupid, they fell for this view, and they always underestimated Eisenhower. Uh, as with Lyndon Johnson, a figure I do not like, but certainly a profound, significant political figure. Uh, he loved to come across as a, a, a Texas country bumpkin when he was anything but. But who pioneers this fake working class persona? Uh, persona in American uh, politics, Franklin again, and he does so not for an American audience. He does so, they, they know he's a, the greatest intellectual in America, the greatest scientist America has ever produced, their most important political thinker. Washington hugely respects and admires Franklin, and Franklin returns the favor, which is revealing too. Franklin does not look on Washington as a butcher, as a guy who drives out the Indians, which is in his own way he does, or just as a stupid thuggish soldier? No, although they come from totally different sides of colonial society, they each see the quality in each other and think the world of each other to the end of their lives, which I think is hugely revealing and hugely impressive on both their parts. So when Franklin goes to France, Franklin likes to act the simple American frontiersman in from the woods, my simple pale common sense. He's playing up to the cliche of, of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is still alive at that time. Rousseau falls for him too, they all do. Of course, at the same time this is going on, Franklin is establishing his own secret societies in Paris, and he is seducing, if he's still physically up to it in the 70s, and I wouldn't put it past him, he still has intimate relations with a number of very attractive French ladies. 
And in fact, when John Adams comes, of course, to Adams, um, if somebody is not your wife, uh, you, uh, you basically have to wear dark glasses looking at her, otherwise there will be a scandal. Uh, this is the kind of Puritan idiot Adams is. And Adams is, out, is a bull in the china shop, and he keeps le uh, lecturing uh, the, the, the bewildered French diplomats in the French court and the French prime minister and foreign secretary at Versailles, no less. And they uh, appeal both directly to the, uh, uh, the, the congressional authorities in the different state capitals back in America and to uh, 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 well, uh, uh, Franklin himself. Mr. Franklin, dear Dr. Franklin, who is this man? Who is this lunatic? You know, you are so understandable, so reasonable. And here he comes telling us to, uh, uh, to sacrifice our entire navies and all our wealth to take on the British firsthand for no reason at all than some alleged claim of justice. What kind of idiot is this? You realize if we discover all your, your fellow Americans are like him rather than you, that's the end of the relationship. There is no way we are going to risk any of, of our precious fleets and marines against the wrath of the most ruthless empire and powerful empire the world has ever seen. And Franklin rightly takes it seriously, and he operates so smoothly that he, uh, he doesn't take on Adams directly. He simply suggests to the authorities back in New York and Philadelphia, and to the, his own key contacts in the Congress, Mr. Adams, of course, is doing a very worthy job here. He works much harder than I do, which is true. Adams was a master at producing endless effort and work to produce only negative results from it, to, to dig the hole he's in ever deeper. Would it not be wonderful if we can send them off to have equally wonderful and brilliant success from the Tsar of, from the Tsarina of Russia? Let us there send them to St. Petersburg up in the Baltic. And he, he can stop off and talk to the Elector of Brandenburg in Prussia on the way back and then spend another couple of years cementing our alliance with the Dutch at The Hague in the Netherlands. In other words, get the damned fool out of the way as quickly as possible for at least five years. And Adams, of course, being the vain, pompous, repulsive little shit he is, is oblivious to all this. And he writes to Abigail, look how highly I am thought of. You know, my work here is so acclaimed back in Philadelphia by the Congress. They are sending me off to perform similar wonders in, uh, 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 with, uh, with Catherine the Great, with the Tarina in Petersburg. Why, I am sure I will have to be there for another two or three years. How our affairs can possibly survive with that drunken retrobate uh, uh, and romancer, uh, romancer of women? Uh, uh, Dr. Franklin here, I do not know. I must tell you how much I, he has disappointed me. I had the highest regards and expectation of him by reputation. And instead, he spends all his time doing nothing except flirting with the ladies. Adams is the kind of fool, and Jimmy Carter was like this too. And we see so many of them in politics. And I fear Liz Truss will be the same for the Brits. That action, they mistake stupid activity for achievement, not realizing they are just digging the hole deeper for themselves. Somehow, Stephen, I have the impression you have come across one or two people like that in your time. <laughs> the light of understanding, man, is in your eyes. <laughs> And Franklin, who remember is now in his 70s, he's in his eighth decade of life. A apart from me, he's probably the oldest person at the seminar if he was around here now. And he knows that there are times, as with a farmer, you have to let the fruit or the crop grow, put down its roots, spread its leaves, spread, get some more sunshine in on it, keep watering it. Too much action too soon can ruin the whole show. And this is a crucial list in diplomacy to this day. Otto von Bismarck understood this. He was uh, had made himself a close personal friend of Tsar Alexander the Second uh, of uh, the future Tsar Alexander the Second of Russia, when he first went to St. Petersburg as the minister from Prussia in the early 1850s. The Tsar was still only the Tsarevich then, a liberal idealistic prince who nobody paid any attention to, and nobody paid any attention to Bismarck because he was seen just as a young, hard drinking, boisterous extrovert Prussian, and Prussia was nothing to begin with, so I take this clan seriously. 
So behind the scenes, they put together 20 years and more. In fact, 40 years, it, it, it continued until Bismarck was driven from power. And uh, or really, basically, the, Brit the British had, had, had the anarchists assassinate Alexander II. Uh, for 20 years, the Tsar, the great Tsar Alexander II, greatest of all modern Tsarist rulers of pre-revolutionary Russia, and the founder of modern Germany were able to build the basis of the great accord to break free of the British French liberal imperialism that was devastating the rest of the world at that time. And they did so under the radar that no one needed to notice because Bismarck, like Franklin before him, knew when to act in public and when not to act in public, when to quietly prepare things under the table under the horizon, under the surface of the ocean. This is very counterintuitive. In every history that you will read of diplomacy or modern history, the heroes are always the guys who make the alliances, the guys who start the wars and finish the wars. It is never the people who play for time. And a very Chinese approach as in the game Go, you build your constellation of allies and alliances so that by the time conflict comes, it's irrelevant. You have already strategically won. Now, I don't believe Franklin, and Franklin would play chess, which is a very overrated game. I maintain that the greatness of American strategy and diplomacy comes from the mastery primarily of poker and secondarily of bridge. And I'll happily give you a full lecture on this, on presidents from uh, Eisenhower and Secretary of State Hamilton Fish, all the way through uh, Truman, Eisenhower, Franklin Roosevelt, you name it. And they don't play cards anymore. It's not seen as intellectually respectable. No, you have to study foreign relations, which is why we're in the appalling mess we are. And you have to be confrontational. And every one of them wants to have wet dreams imagining that Winston Churchill waving the flag in 1940, when the whole theme, as I've discussed before in many future lectures, the whole theme of Winston Churchill's life was he was demolishing the British Empire and the, uh, the wellsprings of British power when the old fool imagined he was building them, but he hadn't a clue what they really were. Franklin is the opposite to this. Franklin builds so well that we are still in both Canada and the United States benefiting from what he built to this day. Now, a final word or two on uh, Newton. There's more to be said on the final word. I have to squeeze it in. Newton has a nervous breakdown in his 40s. As I said before, he, become, he becomes a paranoid schizophrenic. He has almost no friends, and he turns on the handful of friends he has, declaring that they're out to destroy his soul. How? By making him interested in women, by trying to get a date, in other words. Exactly. I mean, you, do you really need to go to Dr. Freud to deconstruct this? But he, there is a happy ending for Newton, not really for everybody else, but for him, because he comes out of his uh, of his nervous breakdown and being depressed when for literally days and weeks at a time he would eat hardly anything, simply stay in his room in total isolation in Cambridge. It is a new, more extroverted Newton. He goes up to London. He uses his legendary scientific background to get a public position for himself. He even sits in Parliament as a member of Parliament on two separate occasions. And for 30 years up to his death in 1696, he becomes first uh, the, the, the ruler of the Royal Mint of Britain in charge of the currency of England and the English and British Empire. And it is not just an honorary position because the position is an executive one. The crown is looking uh, at, uh, Newton is an alchemist, and this is well known. He is obsessed with the smelting and purity and transformation of metals. So what better man could you have to detect counterfeit money? But he goes beyond this. He wants to be Sherlock Holmes, or rather he wants to be J. Edgar Hoover and Lavrenti Beria at the same time. He becomes the secret police chief of England. He is in charge of identifying counterfeiters and arresting them and interrogating them. What does interrogation in 17th century England by the crown mean? It does not mean being politely visited as I have been by the FBI, 
um, this or that and asked questions, which I can assure you is not the most reassuring of experiences, even when they're at the most polite, or perhaps especially when they're at the most polite. No, there's a little bit more to it than that. There is no constitutional amendment in 17th century. How could there be? There is no constitution. There is still no constitution in England to this day, which is very convenient, which means there is no ban on behavior uh, uh, of cruel or unnatural punishment. So you do not have to be convicted of uh, 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 counterfeiting to be tortured at the rack, to be tied down and have your limbs torn until they can actually be torn out of your sockets. We have no direct documentation. Uh, uh, Newton ever ordered that, but we certainly have documentation. He attended such interrogations routinely and regularly over decades at a time. And he appears to have enjoyed doing so. He had a zeal, an envious, he had a zeal for the job. And again, this is a man who would never touch a woman in his life, or a man either. But obviously, again, Dr. Freud would not have been surprised at what he saw here. Or maybe even Freud would have been surprised. But what we see here is actually consistent with his vision of gravity, which I, I think I, I want to close on. Because the 18th and 19th century industrial revolutions and the technologies that built them are based on the science and the physics of Isaac Newton. They are based on the steam engine. They are based on generating steam. They are based on digging out coal to, uh, to heat the, uh, 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 the engines that produce the steam. Now, uh, engines can produce far more raw power than human beings or horses can do before them. But they have to be brought, coal has to be mined and transported, especially in the days before railways, in dirty physical conditions. The smoke from the chimneys destroys the health of millions of people in the city of London and of countless millions in other industrial connotations around England and wherever the Industrial Revolution comes. And this dilemma continues in the world, even to this day. In other words, the physical science and technology based on the understanding of gravity is a physical technology based on hard work and the industrial enslavement of people to tasks they do not want to do. This again brings us back to our other old friend George Orwell, who visited coal miners digging mines in, uh, in pits in the north of England and in Wales, and asked himself coming out, is the only way for civilized human society, such as you and I, as middle class book reading intellectuals, enjoy that we have to send 15 year old boys and 60 year old men dying of cancer and of diphtheria and, uh, uh, and of tuberculosis down these dark pits where uh, huge caverns will collapse on their heads and entomb them forever, hundreds of times a year? Orwell is still asking these questions in the, in the 1930s when the world that created them is already up and running 200 years before as a direct result of the physics of discoveries of Isaac Newton. By contrast, what do we find with, from physical discoveries of Benjamin Franklin? And remember, Franklin does not just uh, stop people again in churches being electrocuted and therefore uh, 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 what's the word deprive the Christian God of his best means of creating martyrs among the faithful. He goes out of way to develop laws of electrical induction. He discovers things that we now know were later incorrectly attributed to Volta and to Faraday and to scientific pioneers who only are 100 and 150 years later in his footsteps. He develops the basics of battery technology and the principles of transmission of electricity. In other words, everything that flows from Edison and Tesla, both of whom are huge geniuses, at the root of both of them is not Faraday, but Franklin. 
but the technology of electricity, as Edison saw, but as most of all Tesla saw, is a liberating technology. We do not even have to go as far as the idea of zero point energy and all the endless arguments for it or against it or what have you. We just look at the world as it has evolved in the last 130 years. And we might also have another very interesting point. There were two great centers at which electrical technology was developed from, and neither of them was in the British Empire, neither of them was in England, and both deep in the 19th century. The first is here in the United States, because you have Edison, and then you have Tesla, and you have Westinghouse, and you have General Electric, and everything comes through them. And the second is in Germany. The pre-Hitler Germany, the Bismarck Germany, the Abraham Lincoln vision for Germany, which was as generous and as technologically done. And remember, Lincoln is a champion of this too. Jefferson Davis is classically read and therefore an idiot. Uh, the electrical telegraph is only invented and conceptualized in 1835. It's already becoming common in America by the 1840s. Although it is in use in the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, uh, uh, Robert E. Lee loses it to an extremely limited degree. He has no interest in coordinating his operations with any other armies in any other theater of war. It drives the other uh, uh, senior commanders of the Confederacy crazy. Jefferson Davis, as far as he is concerned, you do not find uh, uh, you know, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar uh, uh, didn't need the electric telegraph, therefore, why should I? By contrast, Abraham Lincoln every day very often two or three times a day walks the 15 10 minute walk through the back gardens of the white house across lafayette park to what uh i don't think you can go into it anymore i think it's now a part of one of the uh, infinite number of white house private intelligence agencies that one lost track of over the years but you can still see it from the outside the telegraph office within five minutes walk of the uh, uh, uh What's the word? Uh, uh, the iron uh, uh, fence around the the picket fence around the the, uh, the iron picket fence around the White House, where Abraham Lincoln walked at least once and often several times a day to find out what the latest news from the latest fighting fronts was in the Civil War and to communicate with General Grant and General Sherman and the other brighter of his commanders later on in the war forward. Lincoln was a modern man. And of course, the great English military historian, Sir John Keegan, in his appre brilliant appreciation of Ulysses S. Grant, points out that Grant develops the modern language of command, not just of armies, but of entire army groups on different fronts in the language with which he orders and coordinates his different armies across an entire continent in the last two and three years of the Civil War. And it is Grant who actually develops a new language, a new, uh, uh, Grant, as I have said before, is like Franklin before him, a pioneer of modern American transformation and use of the English language. But again, all of this flows from electricity and even in the liberation of the slaves, electricity is a tool of freedom. So I close with this, and if we, have to, if we need a future lecture, I, I, I would be only too happy to explore it with you, but I think it should be more of a, of a joint one with everybody contributing, because this is something nobody has looked at before. The degree to which the philosophy and the various science for which uh, Isaac Newton has claimed is a science of oppression, it is a science of, set, uh, of centralization, uh, everything has to be approved to the Royal Society. Uh, England has has to have primacy in everything, which is why for hundreds of years, Leibniz is denied the credit which is his due for developing the calculus. Newton, why should Newton be so uh, power hungry, egotistical, narcissistic? Think about it. Think of his work on optics, his, uh, his work on planetary orbits, his work on gravity his work on color. There are so many other areas for which Newton would be remembered just as much today as he is if he had acknowledged that Leibniz was the genius who develops calculus. Instead, Newton tries to come up with his own fake version of the calculus, which is vastly inferior to the real pure calculus, which has already been developed by Leibniz. Now, Franklin isn't anything like this. Franklin is generous and open and cooperates very happily to the end of his life with his fellow scientists. He has warm relations with other members of the Royal Society, even when they become political opponents. 
uh, many, uh, in large part, I think through his own influence, many of the, uh, uh, of the greatest scientists in England of the 19th century, like Priestley and his work on gases, are close personal friends of Franklin and are influenced positively by Franklin, not just in their chemistry and their physics, but even in their political conceptions. So you have two totally conceptions of society and learning and knowledge and philosophy here. You have the Republican decentralized concept of Franklin, which cloud computing, of course, fits beautifully into, and which the idea of an open-ended universe with no entropy, with no beginning, with no end, without heat death, which is consistent with what the James Webb telescope is now firing to the great horror and consternation of the vast tribe of tens of thousands of traditional Newtonian or neo-Newtonian astrophysicists around the world. And by contrast, you have Newton's view, which is medieval, which is fundamentalist, which is crackpot. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. This is uh, above and beyond what I expected. Um, really great. Now, as always, it's a joy uh, just to look at the amount of, of doors that we didn't even know existed to be explored and, and opened up. Um, and also- You're all going to explore the doors, Matt. Huh? You and everybody here, you're going to be exploring those doors. You're planting a lot of seeds. Yes, most certainly. Yes, yes, exactly. No, that's good to kindle that fire. And I, I think that uh, what I really appreciate is just how you were able to, especially towards the end, weave together, and you did this throughout the entire thing, planting the seeds and then just cultivating them, um, pertaining to the, the two really clashing paradigms regarding political economy, the way you socially organize a society, and the fact that you identified very clearly, which a lot of people miss, that the system of British political economists from Adam Smith to Ricardo and Mill all have at their heart a sort of Newtonian um, system, an idea of forces uh, pulling and pushing, and that that entire idea is really rooted in a certain uh, Newtonian mecha mechanistic way of thinking, which Malthus also is dealing with, yes. and responding to, and, and coming to solution concepts around, which are devastatingly atrocious, but utilitarian and cold-blooded in their logic, versus this opposing view of a living, vibrant system of dynamics which is more than the sum of its parts, which you see emanating out of Ben Franklin's refutations of Malthus, as you pointed out, before there was Malthus, he was refuting Malthus before Malthus was born um, in the 1740s and 50s, all based on this idea that human beings are a, a creature endowed with create, creative reason, that we can make things better, we can leap beyond our limits to growth when we're acting in love and creativity. So it's really great that you got those two different systems um, that are rooted in a, in a battle of science really nicely in play. And what you said towards the end regarding the idea of a future lecture, I think it would be more than one lecture, as you pointed out, it would be something that would involve multiple voices, uh, maybe a, a, a full day symposium or something that could deal with the, the different aspects of the clash of the, the two sciences or the way of thinking about science. Um, so yeah, the, absolutely. I think that that's a very enticing idea. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, probably. 20, 30 minutes on our side. So there are a couple of uh, voices that got in early. Um, Peter did early on. I know there's a two point question. You might've answered part of it. Peter, go, go for it. Ask whatever is on your mind. Uh, thank you, Matthew. And thank you again, Martin. And I hope that this question uh, is a partial opening of the doors uh, to which you referred. Would you be so kind as to compare and contrast Newton's and Franklin's conflicting embraces of hard money uh, by Newton and paper money by Franklin and the sub question. Oh. Okay. Uh. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I should have done and Thank you for that, Peter. It is enormous. Uh, Newton drives the English economy. Newton uh, has many similarities with Keynes incidentally. Both of them have the reputation of being financial geniuses when they were actually both financial catastrophes. And both of them have the, rep uh, both of them have, uh, uh, the reputation of being incredibly wise when they are terrible investors. In Newton's case, I was astonished to discover he invests in the South Sea bubble, 
the great corn investment at the beginning of the 18th century in 1720. And he loses four or five thousand pounds in it, which doesn't sound like that much, except of course the pound then was worth more than a thousand times or two thousand times what it is now, no, a thousand times what it is now. He lost four million to five hundred million dollars equivalent today of his own money in the one major investment he plunged into. Decades before that, he was very much like Keynes, a socialist centralizer in de decreeing policy. He artificially sets an exchange rate between gold and silver. And he does the same mistake that the Emperor Diocletian made in the fourth century AD. And it's the same mistake that, that that idiot Richard Nixon made and the vile Prime Minister Edward Heath made in England in the 1970s. They impose wage and price controls. Herbert Hoover did the same thing in America at the beginning of the Great Depression, which ensured instead of blowing over within a few months, as the 1920 Depression did under one of our greatest and most underrated and sneered out of presidents, Warren G. Harding. Instead, uh, Wages and prices are frozen, and FDR, uh, whether it's from his own lack of expertise in the field or the fact that he's surrounded by too many left-leaning uh, socialist-type uh, ideologues, including Keynes in the 1930s, never frees up the economy enough. Although after uh, uh, to let it, uh, to to let it restore itself, which happened in 1920. But Keynes makes this huge mistake, and we find, to my amazement, uh, Newton makes the same mistake when he becomes master of the mint in the late 1690s. He imposes enormous economic suffering on England, and incidentally on the Americans too at that time, by fixing silver. He basically sets a gold standard. He, uh, he limits the amount of silver in circulation because, again, like the purest idiot obsessed with his own uh, 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 purity, uh, this, I, I think it's the same fear of women lies with, uh, with his fear of having a currency that may inflate to even the slightest degree. Again, I think we need Freud, uh, uh, we, we need Newton, at least from the historical couch, to be taken apart by Freud on this, because he's inflicting enormous suffering on the in, uh, working class English people at his time. And as a result, he, uh, uh, you find there's a remarkable amount of technological development in England in the 1690s, the beginning of the 1700s under Queen Anne. But in the last 20 years of Newton's life, the Whigs take over, and Newton is basically accommodating to them, and they're very huge in having a very stale, but not stale, a very stable currency. And they limit the amount of silver in circulation. They artificially limit the, uh, the ratio of gold to silver. So there is no market mechanism to drive up the amount of silver there. Newton also, as you point out, Peter, doesn't want a paper economy, which has been developed in the city of London more advanced way than anywhere else from the 1670s onwards. But Newton retards it by a generation until he dies. And even then it's decades before things really loosen up again. So you're absolutely right. And by contrast, what do we find with Franklin? We find what you say. Gold has not yet been discovered in California. California is still 100 years away from being brought into the American system when uh, uh, and the colonies are still just being developed on the East Coast. There is a desperate shortage of cash, yet a growing population and a growing real economy, which is only held back by the lack of gold and currency backed by gold. So once again, Franklin here anticipates Franklin Roosevelt in the best way. He anticipates controlled inflation in the terms of putting more money into the economy to increase economic activities and stimulate investment under reasonable control. Incidentally, Franklin is not a champion of a central federal system. There's a recent book out, one of those very interesting books, which you know, is very disjointedly written, and there's a whole book I think is absolutely a nightmare to get through, but it's filled with brilliant sections that don't really come together. And uh, it's by uh, an American historian called Adam Toos, came out a few years ago. And I forget the exact name of the title. I think it's On the Abyss or something like this. You can look it up easily. If you have any trouble, email me at you or anyone else, and I'll dig out the detail for you. But he brings out how it's only in 1915 or so 
that Woodrow Wilson creates the Federal Reserve. And to this day, liberal progressive historians acclaim the Federal Reserve as one of the greatest achievements imaginable. Yet you don't, obviously, as everybody ought to know, the Federal Reserve does nothing to prevent the catastrophe of the Great Depression in 1929. But what is not realized, and what Tunis brings out, is within four years of the Federal Reserve being created, it artificially creates the worst depression in American history in 1919 to 1920, right after World War I, because Leffingwell, and it's people at the Treasury working with the Fed completely mis uh, 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 imagine the economy is overheating and instead shoot up interest rates and crash the post-World War I economy. So you have the catastrophe of the 1920 depression, which during its first year was deeper and sharper and more frightening than the equivalent first year of the Great Depression a decade later. And yet we are brought out of that depression by a return to more classic uh, uh, and, uh, and stable uh, decentralized economics by uh, uh, Warren Harding and his administration in their first year in 1921. By the middle of 1921, the first Great Depression is over as if it had never been, but it is artificially caused by the bungling and ineptitude of the Fed. And this is what we see with Newton. Newton's conception of the economy is the same as torturing counterfeiters. It is more important to have a limited pure gold economy. You must not have too much silver there. He, has a, a, he is almost as terrified as paper money as he is of women. I think if there is a final word to be said of Newton outside science, that should be the word. He is almost as more. I mean, did anyone here ever watch the TV show Monk, which I absolutely love, about the, uh, an erotic detective who was quite simply afraid of everything, including milk? Right. But somehow he, he still catches the murderer because he's so obsessed with every detail. He sees the detail everyone else missed. And it's beautifully written, but it's acted by a comic genius, a wonderful guy called Tony Shalhou. Right. And uh, there are about 200 episodes of this. Uh, I cannot recommend this highly enough. But the point is, I shall, uh, who would be a genius at playing Newton? I don't think ever, once ever suggested him for the role. He's certainly talented and bright enough and intelligent enough. But the thing is, and he's not like that in real life, he's a great guy in real life, but Newton is like the character of Adrian Monk. He is terrified of everything, but his greatest terrors and fears are ladies and paper money. That a lady should smile at him, he is convinced will damn him to eternal hellfire. This is what you're dealing with. And you're also dealing with a man who for 40 years did calculations on when the Messiah would come and when, uh, you know, and the real meaning of the book of Daniel. And he has more papers on the book of Daniel and on biblical prophecy than he does on all his scientific endeavors combined. So, Peter, thank you. That's just a wonderful question. And because the question was wonderful, the answer is, I hope, is worthy of it. Certainly is. Thank you, Martin. Thank and you, my dear friends. I, I, I just want to add that there is on uh, Ben Franklin's epitaph. There seems to be some ref allusions to uh, uh, the Creator, as we would understand in uh, the Old and New Testaments. I I, I looked it, I looked it up, and it refers to his body becoming food for worms, but then uh, to be uh, reissued by the uh, the author, that not being wholly lost, it will, as he believed, appear once more in a more perfect edition, corrected and amended by its author. I, I remember that when I... Oh, yes, admitted. that's pure Newton. That's pure Newton. No, the, the, this, is ben, this, is ben, ben, this is Ben This is Ben Franklin he's referring to. Who has this? Oh, well, uh, that, that would be a different approach because we know what Ben is. Ben is deist. Ben is a deeply religious man, but he doesn't believe in the Bible for a second. He believes in spirituality. He believes in the deist, enlightenment God, probably the same God that Voltaire does. And he believes in this, uh, I think, basically in the soul. Uh, 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 I mean, I'm open to correction on that. There will be people here who are bound to know much more than that than me. But here again, this is not a conventionally religious man. You do not find 
uh, Franklin for a second poring over the Bible, let alone ever going to church. What you find with Franklin is uh, a, a passionate observation with the complexities of reality and life, whether it's looking through telescopes at the solar system or measuring the Gulf Stream or being fascinated by the rate of growth and the low death rates and the low rates of deaths of babies uh, in Amer American society because there are basic levels of living. One point actually, very different one, but it's a very interesting point here is Ben Franklin doesn't like Jews. He distrusts them enormously and there is a reason for this. And that is the high profile Jews he sees in London, there are almost no Jews in the colonies, but the high profile Jews he sees in London are in finance, a handful of them have made a huge living at the height of finance ever since Gideon, Samson Gideon in the late 17th century is the first great Jewish financial wizard of the city of London. And since then, most Jews in London, even in the small community then, are very poor and modestly off. Most of them are in the trades. Uh, they mostly uh, work and trade shipping produce in that area of the field, but a tiny number are hard profile speculators. And of course, they get the publicity. And uh, Franklin sees them as being very much a central part of this enormous system of capital exploitation that is now threatening North America and has already enslaved Britain and the, and the Caribbean and Africa. So he's hostile to them. On principle, by interesting contrast, uh, Franklin is a slave owner who becomes an ardent and sincere abolitionist and really launches the great abolition moral movement across the north of America, not just up in New England, but as far south as the Mason-Dixon line and converts Pennsylvania, which was not notable for abolition uh, morality before Franklin's influence really got going there on the subject. So he comes out of darkness on this issue, but becomes enlightened. By contrast, he's extremely close to Thomas Jefferson. But on these two issues, they have different paths. Jefferson does genuinely on philosophical grounds loathe the very idea of slavery in the 1770s and onwards, and is genuinely pushing to have an abolition of slavery included in the original constitution. Forget about amendments. He wants slavery condemned in the constitution, but he is blocked on this by his fellow Southerners. And over the following decades, of course, it's Jefferson who becomes much more reactionary on the slavery issue. They go in different directions. But when it comes to Jewish people, Jefferson is tolerant and enlightened. He doesn't expect Jews to be more virtuous than anyone else, but he doesn't expect them to be less virtuous than anyone else either. He, is, uh, he and Washington are both entirely enlightened on this issue, even though Jefferson has spent time in London just as uh, uh, Franklin did, but he draws different conclusions from it. But what is most curious about this is on all the other great philosophical issues of the day, I know later, uh, in fact, it's slavery that pulls Jefferson into his long-term opposi uh, 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 faithful opposition to the strengthening of the union. And that's appalling. But uh, the key point is he starts out in many areas, fundamental areas remains loyal to the basic deist principles of uh, uh, Franklin. He's much more open about his skepticism about religion and the Bible than even Franklin is, because he produces in his own lifetime his own version of the Gospels and the life of Christ which is he basically it's the life of Jesus with all the angels and all the miracles left out. He reveres the Jesus who is a teacher, who is a leader, who is a, you know, a religious moral leader. He reveres this Jesus. He preserves everything he writes. But everything he thinks that the priests have put into the Bible afterwards, into the Gospels afterwards to enslave the human race, that's obviously absurd. Jesus couldn't have done it. Take it out. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would necessarily uh, oh, yeah. say that... Uh that Ben Franklin's concept of, of the creator is, is really in harmony with Voltaire's idea of the creator. I wouldn't go that far, but the, the, my point is they are both enlightenment men and they both do believe, uh, 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 they have the concepts of deism, that there is a oh, God. Sure. 
Yeah. And of course, Newton does too. But Newton's God is forced to be a much more active God in physical terms. Uh, Franklin's science is totally rational. Newton's is not. I think it, uh, 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 it wasn't Voltaire, I think it was Laplace, another of the French philosophers who didn't like Newton, who said that Newton's vision of God is very clear. God is a, a clockmaker. He's made the universe as a clock, but he's a bad clockmaker because God can't even make the, a clock that runs on time in the universe and has to keep winding it up again. Yeah. No, that, that's good. That's a key point. And on that note as well, uh, for those who might have missed it, I uh, slipped in Cynthia Chung's uh, excellent class on Newton versus Leibniz from a couple of years oh, ago, yes. which really vectored around this point of how do you conceive of um, God, the creator and the creation as far as like what identity do you associate with those things? Since we obviously implicitly um, are trying to model ourselves off of truth as best as we can. So if you see God as being this detached or tyrannical force made in the image of, a, of an oligarch, um, you're going to uh, conduct yourself very differently than you would if you saw God as an active living force, both not contained within his creation, because how could God, the creator, be contained within the creation or limited by that, but also not uh, devoid from being everywhere within the creation too. So there's this whole like false dichotomy in the, from the Newtonian uh, philo- or worldview expressed by Clark, who is, I guess, one of the, the figures who chose to, to represent Newton, which is that, no, you have to pick one of the two. It's either God is above, he's like supra mundana, uh, outside of the universe, or he's got to be just contained within the universe. But you have to pick one of the two. And Leibniz is like, wait a minute, that's a false dichotomy. Why do I have to pick one of the two? What if the, what if the universe itself, you know, actually has Im- embedded within it a constant um, impulse towards self-perfectibility. And like you said, with the constitution, the brilliance, the masterpiece of the constitution that, that Franklin put forth is that it's open. It, it's constantly, it's never supposed yes. to be a closed, finished document. Like the universe, it, ha- it has a, a certain philosophical idea that the whole universe is constantly self-perfectible, which is also what Leibniz had said. The, w- the reason why we live in the best of all possible universes that Voltaire disrupted, like Voltaire was assigned through Candide to undermine or at least caricaturize this very sophisticated idea it's in Leibniz's world the proof is well why is why is that proof because I can imagine a better world than the one that I live in that's more just so why is this the best of all possible worlds and it's because we can make it better we have the active subjective role as participants in the universe that was yes, created to exactly. make it better which is um lost to <laughs> I guess a lot of people who try to dichotomize the two of which I would say Voltaire was definitely somebody who dichotomized it when he made fun of uh Leibniz in the form of I thank you I definitely agree with your distinction completely but a uh, because something you know much more about the subject than I do and I know this and b because I do feel when I was simply skating over that again trying to cover all the ground I blurred the distinctions so I think your corrections and uh, precise delineations here are of central importance and in fact it was only in preparing this lecture that I put together for myself the idea that Franklin's idea of an open embrace of an open-ended universe uh, ties in with his embrace of the open-ended frontier but it also extends into the development of history an open-ended constitution which incidentally was an area where jefferson to his credit did stay loyal to franklin on that and of course uh, lincoln and fdr both embrace and embody this deeply themselves Mm -hmm. absolutely my mother has a question um i saw it early on i'm just scrolling up to try to find it here uh, there it is. I got it. Um, so this is something that she and I have talked about, and, and I, I'm, I might embellish a, a bit of that question, but she asks, when Franklin went to England at the age of 19, was that the time he went to spy out the Hellfire Club and his brother, his older brother's participation in it? I don't know if you're familiar at all, Marty, with, with the uh, networks of the Hellfire Club into the colonies that his brother was assigned to uh, to advance a little and not enough in fact i would appreciate your recommendation on reading for this both that you and cynthia and your other colleagues have done on this because it's a subject that very much intrigues me indeed and i think it interacts with several areas Uh, i don't know on this i do know and, and can't say when he first goes over 
He's not sent over as a spy. He's much too young and obscure and lacking in sophistication for that. In fact, the paradox is it's precisely because he's so young and green, as I said. He's only a teenager when he's 19. Now, to this day, if you have anybody from Canada or the United States visiting Britain at age 18 or 19, or from Britain or Ireland visiting America or Canada at that age, they'll, you know, everybody will start off feeling they're the green boy or girl just off the boat. And it takes quite a while to get used to that. But by contrast, when you go back home afterwards, you know, you've learned much more than you realize by your exposure to a totally different society and environment, thousands of miles away, and way of looking at the world. And for this to happen, not in the 20th or 21st century, but in the 18th century, is hugely profound. So my sense would be, there's a, a Jewish term called mystical, semi-mystical term, actually it's in popular culture, called Beshert, B-A-S-H-E-R-T. And it basically, it's very similar to Einstein's conception of gravity. Einstein says, how do you explain gravity? Gravity tells something to fall where kind of the natural flow of forces means that it would be most comfortable. In other words, in a sense, gravity is destiny, correct? Right? And the shirt means that in your life is something benign happens to you or something unexpected that shapes you in an eternal way for good or bad, preferably for good, then it's the shirt. Then it's meant by God, the universe, karma or fate or destiny, and it'll work out for you. And I think most of us, especially as one gets older, have had experiences of that. You know, when you look back on your life and you think things that worked out that I thought would be for the bad turned out to be for the good or vice versa. And I think a lot of it is simply one's own temperament. People with a positive, upbeat temperament of life like Franklin will always find the cup is half full rather than half empty. But if you look in Franklin's life, he, uh, he wanted the opportunity of getting on in the world and exploring the world. And he grabbed it with both hands, even when he was a teenager. But as a result, this doesn't make him a genius. He was a genius. This doesn't explain his amazing work in science and electricity and philosophy, and for that matter, in economics and socio in, in developing society. But it gives him a bit of a start in it. And, you know, he keeps taking advantage of opportunities. And as I said before, most people will... Even if they develop in their life, they'll stop developing, especially relatively early on. Uh, I mean, I look at all the friends I had in Oxford all those decades ago. And again, this is not an ideal environment, because in a way, it's a condemnation of the world of Newton and the Oxbridge world that he came from. You are shaped in your destiny when you are 18 or 19 or 20 years old, and you never move from it, and you never change, and you never grow. That's a very centralized English, uh, uh, aristocratic, Downton Abbey, tired, imperialistic, heat, death, limited uni of the universe view of the world. But if you are American, or hopefully the better kind of Canadian, who doesn't accept the restraints that people have kept trying to impose on you, unsuccessfully, I think, for 150 years, and the reason that Ultimately, the unsuccessful is very simple. Canada is huge, huge and generous. And that automatically creates a freedom of opportunity that you simply cannot have in the overcrowded old country. Uh, Newton is part of this old world. And Franklin never stops growing. He grows to France. He's still growing in his mid-80s when he's helping frame the Constitution of the United States. Here is an old man deep into the ninth decade of his life, what, 82, 83 years old, when he's working on the Constitution. And he sees, I'm not going to, for, as far as Newton is concerned, I've said almost the last word on everything. Maybe people have a few gaps to fill in that I left out. He does admit that it can be a mathematica. But basically, my framework is the truth and it will stand. But that's not Franklin's approach at all. Franklin wants the Constitution to be open. He wants all slaves to be freed. He certainly uh, uh, is not afraid of the idea of universal voting rights for women or for black people or for uh, Native American people either. He's championing Native American rights as early as the 1740s. 
even when it's an extremely dangerous and unpopular thing to do in his own state, and he has nothing whatsoever to gain by doing so. Fascinating man. So he, in that sense, he's the best kind of American. He's open-ended. He sees the universe as limitless. One last point here is there is a, a Paul Johnson, very interesting British writer, loves Mrs. Thatcher, loves Britain, but hates the empire and hates the royal family. Interesting con con series of conflicts written, contradictions, wouldn't you say? He wrote a history of the American people, not of the American Republic, but of the American people. And Franklin is his greatest hero in the book. He loves Lincoln too. But Franklin, this is a British intellectual writer, a liberal internationalist in modern terms. So it's hard to, you know, you can't fit him into the categories we're most familiar with. Or rather, we can, but we have to realize he doesn't fit in them in all places. But he writes beautifully and appreciatively about Franklin. And so does an American writer, who's actually a key member of the establishment, but he loves Franklin and appreciates him, and that's Walter Isaacson. Finally, I mean, I mentioned before, uh, Isaacson's biography of Franklin is the best generally conventional, but nevertheless reliable and easily written and accessible biography. There is a Franklin. It covers, I think, well, it doesn't cover everything in Franklin. No one can. But it covers more aspects of him, especially the science, in more and sympathetic, more detail than any other single book does. And secondly, for Newton, uh, many of the most entertaining, dark, twisted parts of Newton, you will find in Frank Manuel's biography of Newton, which came out more than 50 years ago. But it has the benefit of, you know, he's been through all the alchemical papers and the religious papers, and he knows what Newton did in the mint. And even there, you have to look outside and to see what Newton really did in the mint. Because it isn't, again, even here, a case of people covering it up. They haven't. It's just that there's all this evidence of what, how counterfeiters were dealt with. They were tortured horrifically and then torn apart before being executed. And then separately you read, well, Newton interrogated counterfeiters and, you know, he convicted them and he attended their punishment. Well, what was their punishment? It was barbaric torture and execution. And what was their interrogation? It was incredibly inconceivable torture that the Gestapo and the NKVD would have been proud of. And this is Newton. But both sides of this are in the public domain, but there's a, a dichotomy in putting them together. And I would say, put them together. Now, I see a reference to Doctor Who. I can't even remember mentioning Doctor Who, but Doctor Who, of course, has been the most popular and long-running science fiction fantasy show in the world since 1963. And I'm so old as a kid, I saw the first episode and was hooked. Oh, not quite for life, because the first, most recent Doctor is abominable. Uh, fortunately, she's just left the role. And uh, there's a wonderful guy called Russell T. Davis who created the modern golden age for Doctor Who and has now brought back, I've been brought back to save the show because the BBC again is a victim of market forces, which in this case is a very beneficial force because they messed up the show so much over the past five years, they need its most successful practitioner to try and save it again. But that's what Doctor Who refers to. And I can't even remember the context I would have mentioned to men. If anybody remembers, please just remind me. There's one uh, on the issue of sci-fi, um, what you proposed regarding the, uh, the Kirby, um, Jack Kirby story, and what was really under the surface of Kirby, because I, you know, I was a, uh, a fan of comic books from a different generation as you, I was, you know, into the, the you know, McFarlane, Jim Lee, 1990s stuff, and, and so, um, Jack Kirby was somebody who had a style that wasn't really appealing when I was young. But you're saying that there was a depth to his thinking about his, his compositions, what he was doing that, that is missed by most, and, and relating that to Tolkien, I find that that's just a fascinating idea. So we got to talk about a future, a future presentation. Well, by all means, incidentally, for both you and anyone else who's interested in that, I've written, but I'm not yet published on this. I've got an upcoming book. And again, this is kind of a chapter which isn't even about the main theme of the book, but it's about, you know, primeval traditions of, you know, 
ancient giants, blah, blah, catastrophism in the past, this and that, how it gets passed down through folklore. And one of the chapters in that book is devoted to both Tolkien and Kirby. And I actually developed that chapter by accident because at first I thought, well, Kirby is really doing, uh, you know, he cre he's creating this fantasy world where there are advanced civilizations like Atlantis and this, that, and the other. And in fact, in Marvel Comics, Kirby created so many ancient civilizations every month for Marvel Comics that, Jack, that his editor and writer, Stan Lee, per Stan had difficulty keeping up with Jack's creativity and making it credible because every week you were stumbling across a different ancient civilization that he just invented on the spur of the moment. But if you look at the life, the personal life and biography of Kirby, and you look at the life of Tolkien, it is astonishing how parallel they were and they should not have been. Who was Tolkien? Tolkien was an English patriot and traditionalist who hated the industrialized world and was a professor of philology at Oxford all his life. And he should have been, and, I, and he was also a devout traditional Catholic. So you would expect him to be like Newton, an intolerant, mean, arrogant, repressive, nailed down individual. And Kirby comes from the opposite background. Kirby is a Jewish boy from the working class side of New York City. He grew up, grows up in Devil's Kitchen, where the gangs of New York, the Irish gangs, ruled for 100 years. If you've seen the, oh, familiar with the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's actually where the bus authority building is today. Every time you know, we, we, we bother take, well, don't drive into New York to avoid the traffic, but take a bus, you go to where Jack Kirby was born and raised, because the court authority is built on it, right? And he becomes one of the arguably the most prolific comic book artists in history. And he creates Captain America in 1940. And he's active until he dies at the age of 77 in 1994. And he is shaped by the science fiction optimism and bound, like Isaac Asimov and the great other science fiction writers, he's shaped by the boundless vision of New York City in the era of the ninth Warring Twenties and World War II and the building of the Chrysler Building and the building of, of the Empire State Building. So wherever you go in Kirby, you have soaring towers, visionary things, and he has giant cities on the moon. He actually has a story about the face on Mars, which he writes in 1958 as a cheap background thing in comic, 18 years before NASA discovers the alleged face on Mars, which may well be a photographic glyph, I hate to add, but my point is he has this weird genius for intuitively anticipating not maybe what is, but what people want to believe. He's a walking X-Files. He develops all these ideas that nobody else pays any attention to for 30 to 50 years after he dies. He has modern smartphones he invents in his comic, The New Gods, in 1970. He calls it Mother Box. Mother Box, he only you to call, or all the new gods have them. They can call all the other new gods. But it's also a diagnostic tool. It, you know, it, 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 it tells them how their health is doing. Uh, it soothes them down emotionally, like soothing music that you can play on your smartphone. You know, it gives you all the, the, the computer calculations you need. And this is 35 years before Steve Jobs creates the iPhone. And Kirby's already visualized it. And he keeps doing this, repeats, but uh, when I bring him, compare him with Tolkien, it's for this. He and Tolkien are both creators of mythology. They create new ancient paths for the world. They create new mythologies of new gods that they create. Uh, Tolkien goes back in time and says, this is Middle Earth and early Earth uh, before our Earth even existed. And so does Kirby. He creates Asgard. But here's Asgard, the Viking Asgard. What's the Viking Asgard? What did they visualize? They visualized Thor and Odin lived in big uh, wooden halls in heaven, right? And drank lots of meat, lots of beer, right? But that's not Jack Kirby's Asgard. Jack Kirby's Asgard is the Asgard you see in the Thor movies. And the first great director who realized that vision was my fellow Belfastman. Uh, Sir Kenneth Branagh. 
And he, like me, read Thor comics when he was a boy. He even includes a Thor comic in his autobiographical movie, Belfast, about growing up in the middle of the Civil War in Belfast in the 1960s. Kirby's Asgard is science fiction brought to life. It's, you know, moons on uh, uh, tar pillars miles high on the moon and just as you've uh, oh, it's Marty, giant Marty, space Marty, stations just wait, what they quick yes we'll but the one the last thing here is kirby we we, we, we yeah. kirby and the, uh, kirby uh, had been a fighting soldier in world war ii uh, and uh, uh, with Patton's third army yeah. and in the world war one Tolkien had nearly been killed in the Battle of the Somme and all his friends were killed there. And this is central to both their visions, that you cannot have justice and happiness without the good having to fight and die and suffer to create and maintain the security of the innocent. Okay. You, want, you want to give people something to come back to, uh, but this is that's Absolutely. definitely a lot, <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> than, I, than I realized. Um, we have time for one last question. That's why I, just, I didn't want to be rude, but we. Oh no! I'm, no, please. Go ahead. I apologize yeah, really to want, you, Matt. You know that. I really want John to be able to ask his question. Uh, so, John, I'm on. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, I just want to know where bits of Belfast you're from. Oh, we, I, I sent you a message on chat on that, but not in full detail. I'm from the north end of Skegenil Avenue at Fort William on the Antrim Road. Right. Kenneth Branagh, at the same time, a few years younger than me, was growing up on the shore road at the uh, at the lower working class, but also safer end of Skegenil Avenue. And have you seen John the movie Belfast yet? No, uh, I, I need to watch that. I, <laughs> when I'm, you see I it, I live on it, the shore road as well, but I live at the bottom of the Longwood Road near Abbey Centre. Oh, that's that's a bit further out along the road, as I recall. Absolutely. Yes, no, if it was not, I mean, of course you'd be further along the shore road. Yeah. And in fact, I didn't go to the Grove School as a school, but I went there for my swimming lessons every week. Oh. I was the swimming pool in the Grove in his school every week. See, I'm, I'm half Swedish, so it was kind of all about, I went to White House first, uh, but that was only yeah, for sure. a few years. Yeah, and then um, we moved back to Sweden for a few years, and then it was in school there and then we came back here again when that time we moved to Hollywood and then we came back over to here over because we used to live in Marble and then we moved back over to where we are now which is just at the bottom of the long road but it being all about the place. You sound the way I used to in fact my, my wife is fond of saying that a major reason she married me was for the accent and she would never have done so <laughs> now because I've lost so much of it over the years. But whenever I'm back and I, you know, with people I don't know in Belfast, I open my mouth and people take me for American. Uh, uh, have you been in America? Or I'm not too sure. Oh, is, uh, see, I'm all, I'm all new to this. this, is, this <laughs> I've, I've only started watching Matt maybe, what was it, maybe like a month ago? That's about it. That's how I got into you saw this. Oh, sure. Uh, give me a shout by email too. Actually, let me put my, if chat is still on it, let me put it yeah, yeah, for anyone yeah, who yeah, wants or needs it. Still on it. And John, but, I'll just do a little plug. John made a little, he, he blew my mind with a little uh, particular fact. He's, he's, <laughs> he's working on a little a little mini research project I, I asked him to, to pull together. And it, it's, it's interesting. It's really interesting <laughs> regarding a connection to the Irish uh, famine that I never, I never looked at before. Uh, John, on. he's saying, um, hey, did you know that the, uh, the, the the emperor the Ottoman emperor actually stepped in to uh, no! to say yeah Abdul Majid the first he uh, he um, well I mean maybe Matt can send you over the, the draft that I have but he uh, he sent us aid as uh, ten thousand pounds well he was going to send ten thousand pounds aid over but then uh, the queen or well diplomats told him not to send that much because uh, it would embarrass the queen because she'd only sent us two thousand pounds so we had to lower the amount to one thousand pounds but he he supposedly there's not much evidence for it but um he supposedly sent uh three ships up uh the irish sea to jochida and uh ships of aid and medicine stuff like that because the dublin ports and the the, the cork ports were obviously blocked by British Navy and British regiments. So he, he snuck it in in Jokhida. Um, But it was just a nice little story with the, the Turkish Sultan. Yeah, it's a beautiful little vignette. It's a good find. Oh, I think that's a wonderful story. I mean, in a way, the famine even is another side comment what we were talking about, because Adam Smith wants to be another Isaac Newton. 
His conception is that free market economics with zero government involvement is as much of an expression of the true divine force, their version of deism, uh, Newton's version of deism, as gravity is. And therefore, it is a sin against God for the government to interfere with any workings of the free market system. And William Ewart Gladstone and Earl Russell, the grandfather of Bertrand Russell, both believe this implicitly, and they both believe that any aid to Ireland or any food that is sent over there will only ruin those feckless Irish even more. And they're obviously starving because they deserve to starve. Yeah. This is the conception. So Adam Smith free market economics comes straight from Newton. And it is applied as a broad tool of repression that leads to genocide intended or not, just as communism did in the starving of the Ukrainian people under Stalin from 1929 to 1932. And interestingly enough, you'll find if you haven't already, John, Irish historians, uh, obviously not in the North, but most definitely in Dublin, mm -hmm. have been fascinated by the Ukrainian famine of 1929-32. A lot of work has been done on it by Irish scholars precisely because they see the parallels with the Irish experience. Mm. See, I, I know that um, during the famine, the British have this whole mentality of um, we're not, we shouldn't be paid anything that we haven't actually worked for, even though we're emancipated and, and can't really work anyway because there's no food, there's no money and we're all dying. But exactly. the, with the... <laughs> The famine roads were one of their uh, great ideas of just telling us to go and lay rocks in some random direction in the middle of a hill. Um, yes. And then they pay us pennies for it, obviously. And we'd, we'd have to walk miles and miles just to freeze to death and then just be left on the road. And that would, but as they I recall, been... you're, you're absolutely <laughs> right, of course. Uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I recall, their particular choice of area was the nearest they could get to Gulag, which was <laughs> the... Uh, the up on the County Antrim shore at the time, as far to the north in the middle of winter as you could get. Yeah, I think I think it actually they started before the famine of nineteen or not nineteen eighteen forty five. There was another smaller one yes, in eighteen forty, was it? And that would well, that was called the the Great Frost or the Big Frost or something along those yes, lines. Yes, yes, that yes, was right. that was when the main um, famine roads were really in action. And then there was learn about the workhouses nearly as well down in uh well they were down in Cork and then they were also up in sorry I've got a map up because I forgot the name <laughs> Mayo they're up in Mayo as well with the workhouses but um exactly. that's, that's what I've been learning about this because, books because in in over the next two weeks we have uh two lectures where we're really going to get to unpack this with Anton Shakin who's going to go through this period a little bit but more from the Lincoln uh standpoint and the anti mm -hmm. fight in the United States and then the weekend after. We have a gentleman um, who has actually authored a book um, on the intentional genocide of the Irish, um, who's going to go through that specifically. So you will be able to have a lot of unpacking and discussion around that. Now, what Marty just did by bringing in the Newtonian element behind Adam Smith, Gladstone, the Russells, uh, that is something that I think most people just completely miss is the underlying source of the, the logic out of which this ugly, ugly tree has grown uh, from a root. And uh, that's vital, vitally important that we see that, that this dead mechanistic uh, Newtonian system is there with all of its arrogance and egotism, which also animates, like you just pointed out, the, a personality like both Newton or uh, Adam Smith, who wanted to sort of fit the entire universe and God into their own ivory tower model of what they think it is, you know, projecting themselves and not all of their their failures onto the characteristic of God uh, with de devastating consequences to humanity every single time it's done. Really, really good. If strange I can add... I, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead John. Oh, well, I was just going to say, it's strange because I've been thinking about the whole um, uh, structure of the universe and the relationship with the universe and the divine for so long now, ever since, um, I forget what the, the, the session was that you had, but I've been, I don't know, it just keeps coming through my head. And um, I went to a talk in the the Mac, Marty. You probably know where that is. Um, yes. It's, so I went to the Mac. There was a wee session called uh, Seed Talks, the Science of Psychedelics. And there they were talking about so many of the um, Silicon Valley um, 
major scientists were on LSD and <laughs> shrooms at the time when they made their discoveries. Because what happens when you take psychedelics is that it actually um, dampens the brain's ability to, well, you have to first think of the brain as a filter for the reality that already exists. So our brain doesn't generate consciousness, it filters it down to a level that we see in the world. And um, what the mushroom actually does is it starts to remove that filter. So it, ne it doesn't overload the brain, but new connections can be made and more connections are being made um, at a faster rate when you're actually on psychedelics. So that was really interesting. Well, that's wonderful. Um, uh, 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 you, you, we keep chain reacting here and you've just done it again, John, because uh, I saw in uh, some History Channel documentary a few weeks ago on Steve Jobs, mm. that Steve Jobs yeah. was ex exactly, I mean, he went to an ashram in India and throughout his life until he died, he regularly visited and he ended up financing very generously because he felt he owed them so much. Uh, a very advanced enlightenment center, a very well-known one in Northern mm. California. And he credited his vision of uh, n n n the iPhone and not just how it works, because of course the key thing with the iPhone is not the technology. His mm. genius, just as with Edison was so often the case, was putting together building blocks of technology that already existed in ways that nobody had conceptually realized they could exist before. Yeah. And actually, couple of books, again, if I can throw out. First, I hope he's still alive, a wonderful British, uh, Professor Goodman, who I, uh, I'm delighted to see. Uh, uh, bless you, Susan, for watching in here. You will remember this too. James Burke, a, a, a tele British television presenter of genius in the 1960s and 70s, wrote a book on technological advance called Connections, in which he shows how the wine press in uh, being developed in the Middle Ages, for example, in the Rhineland is central to the development and invention of the printing press and everything that comes from that. And how the development of three-dimensional painting in Florence and the Renaissance lead to the development of a, a much more accurate map making than was possible before and oh. makes possible the age of discovery and the age of exploration. How, in other words, different discoveries chain react on each other in ways that cannot possibly be imagined in advance. It's really, really interesting to look at the, the human race and, and just more the packlet and, or the, the planet on a more macro scale when you kind of zoom out on everything and just analyze the interactions between them. Everything exactly. always gets clearer. But for some reason right now, when you go into education, they want to um, reduce it all down to this neat kind of confined uh, box of how everything works in stages while what always makes sense and usually makes the, the, the best discussion, discoveries is through analyzing the interaction between completely different systems at varying scales. I think it was I Alan, think that's, Al, Alan Savory uh, did a, there was a wonderful excerpt. Yes, I sent you an email. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, you said, I, I lose track of things. But it's a, it's a really great point that he makes when he's like, you know, demonstrating what actual greening of a, of a desert area could be it, by just using very holistic, natural, common sense techniques. And, uh, and he's discussing with a younger, a younger gentleman who's making the documentary, the problem of academia and how everybody is being, uh, is, is, is going through the academic system to get their PhDs and in the process, having their spirit of, of humility, innocence, love of creativity, their vibrancy crushed by trying to be or being told that they have to be published in peer reviewed journals. And, and that's really the, the, the nature of science to be published. In, and he's like, no, that's just simply saying things that other people already agree with. No discovery ever, ever came from having experts of a, of a certain specialized field all agreeing on a thing. It's, oh, it usually tends to come from the, somebody who's outside of that field of hyper specialization. And he makes the example of the, the greatest candle maker could not have conceived of electricity, right, of his time. Mm. And, uh, and you need to sort of have that, that cross-pollination amongst multiple disciplines to be able to, to make any discovery of any one of the disciplines per se. And I think all of human experience really, really uh, just testifies to that. I know he, he actually does, um, I think he has a whole institute, institute of uh, courses that you can pay for to do and actually study the holistic 
holistic pasture management i think that's what he calls it yeah. but um he's got in courses doing it. i think i might want to do one because recently i've gotten into ag uh, agronomy and uh you might see with this book that i'm trying to work myself through <laughs> oh it's literally just an entire guide to agronomy but i'm also studying um internet networking and architecture but i don't know if i want to do that anymore <laughs> it's it's not really <laughs> dialogue going. This is good. I mean, I, I think that you definitely got the spark, Judd. No, I don't think I know. You yeah, got yeah. The spark. <laughs> Very good. Just keep feeding that. That's uh, that's excellent. And Marty, you're 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 creating sparks beyond belief. And I think that this is going to resonate, especially the people even watching on social media, on on YouTube, on the other platforms we broadcast to. Um, your time and energy and the investment you've made with the time of your life is is excellent it's a real real great exciting process and i'm looking forward to future presentations by you as well we're also going to make your books available so anybody watching this at this point if you don't want to read marty's books you're missing something go rewatch this class again i'm going to make the links to marty's uh published works already available i'm hoping that your new book comes out sooner sooner than later i know it's been a long time that we've been waiting for this book to come online do you, do you have a date for when that's going to happen not at all. In fact, I, again, here, I am a firm believer, as I know you and Cynthia are, Matt, in what's the word, throwing the seeds out on the lawn and hoping one or two will sprout. And this is a book, it is completed. It is called Unlikely Angels. And it's a popular historical reassessment of uh, half a dozen, seven, six or seven individuals who each saved hundreds of thousands or multiple millions of lives by ending genocides or rescuing huge numbers of people from them. And the twists here are first, in most of the cases, these are people who are, with one exception, who are very well known or, or individuals in positions of responsibility, and they did enormous good, but nobody realized they did it partly because they didn't want it known themselves for different reasons, and partly because they are so outside, again, as you know, one of my accepted, my favorite concepts, they're so far outside the accepted paradigm. I mean, one of my individuals is a Soviet communist leader, Nikita Khrushchev, who saved millions of people from the gulag by opening up uh, 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 the prison doors for so many. Another is the only major Western leader who saved, uh, who was directly active in saving uh, a million J Jewish people from the Holocaust. But he was a, a, a relatively conservative New Dealer who was hated by liberals and conservatives alike. And he was Jewish and he was German and he was a New York banker. So everybody assumed he couldn't possibly be virtuous, though he was Henry Morgenthau Jr., sec FDR's Secretary of the Treasury, and also FDR's closest friend, personally. Extraordinary story. And in British history, not Winston Churchill, who did not raise a fingernail to save a single uh, Jewish life, and also his record in allowing hundreds of thousands of terrified Cossack and Ukrainian refugees from Stalin to be shipped back just to be slaughtered, not as a genocide per se against Ukrainians, but just on principle in 1945, it was quite monstrous. But a man who Churchill despised, Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, who keeps the immigration gates for both, from both Poland and Germany open to Palestine in the 1930s, and it's a quarter of a million people in, and then who personally directs the famous kinder transport, the rescue of 21 in five of all the German Jewish children in Germany in the single year before World War II begins. And this would never, for all the individual kind was shown by tens of thousands of individual British people in this episode, it would never have happened except for one man, Stanley Baldwin. And he never looked for any credit for it in his own lifetime. And of course, uh, John, just because there's an Irish hero as well, I think the greatest of them all, uh, uh, Roger Casement, who ends a genocide in Africa that took 10 million lives over the previous 30 years through the city of London and directed by the, the King of Belgium for sheer profit and greed and for no other reason. And eventually, of course, he's hanged on a trumped up charge of treason, which he did not even commit during the Easter Rising of 1916, a most extraordinary story. But so far, all the conventional you know, uh, uh, Holocaust industry people in Britain have ref refused to uh, print me on this because, for two arguable reasons. First, because my net is too wide, because I, I'm taking uh, key people eclectically from so many different backgrounds. 
And secondly, they say, because you're being too popularist in, uh, uh, in what you're writing. And my answer, of course, is I'm actually uncovering with each of these people levels of motivation and mechanism, not just who they saved, but how they acted to save so many people. What, I mean, uh, the chapter on Baldwin I must finish here, but it's a classic example on how you can use the shortcomings of government bureaucracy to save lives as well as endanger them. Preventing government from acting in the wrong way can be as a, more important than encouraging it to act in the right way. Yeah, this, this is the, definitely, uh, these are stories that need to be told. So we're going to be waiting with baited no, of course. That full, uh, that full product. And you might have to just go for the self-publishing route like Cynthia and I have done. Uh, I, actually, let's talk well. about that. I think that's exactly what I need to do. Yeah, I think so. Just go for it. And uh, I think on the issue as well of, of and then we'll, we'll have to close out, but on the issue of the, the government, you know, a lot of people have been used to seeing cases of government being used as an instrument to uh, hurt and enslave and cause wars. And that's the only image they get uh, um, thrust into their face that they forget that government, just like any tool created by humankind, is a tool that could be used based upon wisdom or uh, dishonesty and evil. And so we have to also look and study those examples, like what Ben Franklin created of governments and power being used to do good and, and create peace treaties and create cooperation instead of just destroying and enslaving. So that's a, a good little way to bridge that back also to your, your key theme of Newton versus uh, of Ben oh, it, if I may, it's even more time on target than that, Matt, because mm -hmm. the key hero in this case is one of the main architects of the New Deal, and he does it through a New Deal agency, and he does it with the full empowerment and support of the President of the United States, who is Franklin Roosevelt himself, who is the only allied leader with the modern dimension to recognize the need to set up a specific agency of rescue. It never occurs to Churchill to do anything like this. Mm. And of course, for Stalin, the idea is laughable. Mm -hmm. Marty, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.